I call to order the regular session of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, September 13th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Vatikiotis? Here. Vice Mayor Lunt? Here. Commissioner Carr? Here. Commissioner Eisner? Here. Commissioner Kouyas? Here. Um, this evening's invocation will be given by Reverend Milton Smith, the chaplain for the Tarpon Springs Fire Department and the Tarpon Springs Police Department. If we can all stand, and then after the uh, invocation, turn and pledge allegiance to the flag. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you grateful for all of your many blessings. We are grateful for this beautiful city, Tarpon Springs, Florida. We pray for all of our city leaders, this board of commission and city staff. Grant them wisdom and knowledge as they make decisions. Let their work be for the good of all citizens and visitors. As this country has just reflected on the events of 9-11, 21 years ago, we pray especially for the police and fire departments. Keep them safe as they protect us. Now we ask your blessing upon this meeting. We invoke your presence here tonight. We pray these blessings in your holy and righteous name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we get started, um, I've got a couple of announcements. Um, we have with us this evening Mr. Randy Mora of Trask Dagnall. He's filling in for Mr. Trask as our city attorney. I'd also like to announce um, items 19 and 25 will be deferred. Item 19 is to request to negotiate a development agreement, uh, HP Capital, and this has got to do with an 82-unit apartment uh, complex along uh, Distant South Distant and, and uh, Mango Street. Um, actually, this item was uh, uh, caught uh, by Vice Mayor Lunt as far as having a question on it, and he presented that to, uh, uh, to the planning director, and she decided it was best to, uh, to defer it. I think this is the second or third that Vice Mayor Lunt has done, uh, although I'm beginning to wonder whether he's doing it just to shorten the agendas. Um, <laughs> Also, we're deferring item 25, application 22-170, 22-68, and that has to do with the uh, car wash and the billboard sign at the corner of uh, Klosterman Road in US 19. Uh, the first item 19 will be deferred to a date to be determined, and item 25 will be, um, the second readings will, are deferred to uh, September 27th, 2022. This evening we also have a uh, special presentation by Robin Redd, the Executive Director of the Tarpon Springs Housing Authority. She's with us this evening and Ms. Redd, if you'd like to come forward. Good evening. Can you all hear me all right? Ooh, that's pretty powerful. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Councilman. Um, and of course, City Manager Mark LaCour, I appreciate all your support over the years. Um, I came tonight because I just wanted to bring uh, to your attention an overview of our agency. I hope that the supportive documentation that I provided into the packet was very helpful. Um, I think it's really important to, um, to look at the track record of our housing authority. Uh, in the HUD world, we are considered a small agency. They're small, medium, and large. They make it pretty simple. Um, and I think that's because everything else that HUD does is very, very complicated. Um, but as a small housing authority in such a special city um, here in Tarpon Springs, we we've been able to comp accomplish a great deal. Um, the housing authority was established in 1965. HUD came in, purchased the land, and worked with the city. And the city appointed us a board of commissioners. They were very, very special leaders at that time, and they forged through and passed the baton through all these years to other commissioners um, to be the leadership uh, for staff um, so that we can do the best that we could to, to help residents. Um, as I mentioned, 1965, that was a really, really long time ago. 
And so like our own homes and our businesses, they age. And so over the years, it was really important to our commissioners to make sure that the homes that the residents were living in and the properties were um, safe and high quality and beautiful and someplace that they could be proud of. Um, this was very difficult to do, to do over the years, very, very difficult. Um, but by working with HUD, they have a number of different repositioning programs. And so what our leadership of the commission charged staff to do, like myself, is to pursue repositioning programs. And examples of that is Section 8 programs instead of public housing, low-income tax credit programs, rental assistance programs. These are all various programs. And the, the reason why is so that an agency can, number one, provide the residents more options, more subsidy options, and more mobility with their uh, assistance, but also a way for the agency to invest in the assets and make them bigger and better, and oftentimes be able to create more apartments like we did uh, recently with, with Eagle Ridge. So unfortunately, we had Mango Circle for so many years, and it was really, really difficult for us to pursue repositioning, but we finally accomplished it. I want to thank the city councilman uh, for coming out to our special ribbon cutting ceremony, and, and Mark and Reverend, he did our special prayers and blessings over the property. Over the years, we've been able to do three 9% tax credit developments. The first one was Oak Ridge Estates. That is 65 apartments located in two different uh, uh, locations in Tarpon Springs, and that is 65 family, family units. That was in uh, 2010. In 2015, we were able to do uh, another complete, uh, very thorough renovation for the villages of Tarpon. And this is 95 apartments dedicated to residents that are 55 and up. That was our second 9% tax credit property. Then we had Mango. So all the years we were trying to get Mango done, we got Oak Ridge and the Villages done. And finally, we were able to get the tax credit award for Mango Circle to be demolished and our new Eagle Ridge apartments to be built. At that time, we were also able to add additional apartments. So it was originally 56 and it became 71. And if you all have not been out to see Eagle Ridge apartments, please do so. Um, it is, I see it as a gift to the city it has changed the la landscape and the footprint, and I think it's something that all Tarpon residents should be very, very proud of. Mm -hmm. um, it, this property is helping uplift these families and, and raise the children um, so that they can temporarily have uh, housing assistance and then move on to uh, bigger and better for themselves with that, with that financial support. So do we have any public housing yet left? Yes, we do. We have 71 public housing apartments remaining. They're in the public housing program. It's, it's not a good program for the residents. And the reason is because there's no mobility. If a resident goes through the process of a wait list and application and finally gets approved for public housing on this one particular apartment, if there's something that happens within their family that they need to relocate because of employment or family or needs for their children, whatever it may be, they cannot move and take that housing assistance. They're stuck, so to speak not good at all. And so like the low income tax credit program or the section <coughs> eight program, we wanna do what we can to change and reposition the public housing program of these remaining units. Our commission had just, has decided on the streamlined voluntary conversion program. And basically what that is, is an expedited process to make sure that all of our current residents are gonna be gifted a section eight voucher. When they find this out, they're, they're gonna be elated. It's really difficult to get a Section 8 voucher, and they're gonna be really, really happy. And, and what will happen with them? Well, it's basically stay, move, or wait. They can stay in the apartment with their new Section 8 voucher. They can move to a different apartment that accepts Section 8. Um, and by the way, all the Section 8 vouchers are gonna come from the Pinellas County Housing Authority. They are the local administrator. And then um, their other option is to wait. Now, if they decide to move right away with their Section 8 voucher, the Tarpon Springs Housing Authority will pay for all of their moving expenses. If they decide to take their Section 8 voucher um, at a later time, one year, two year, three years down the road, then yes, they will automatically receive the Section 8 voucher, but they will not have all their expenses paid. 
um, moving expenses. So really, it's a win-win-win for the residents. What does it do for our housing authority? It will increase the amount of capital fund income that we receive from HUD. An example for you is that this year, we are receiving $134,000 in capital funds for all of our 71 apartments. $134,000, what can you do with that? A couple roofs, right? Some landscaping, some irrigation, downspouts, but not too much. We have many residents that are starting to process out and they're moving on and they've been in the unit for 20, 25, 30 years. And those units need a lot of work. 134,000 could probably just go into one unit. So that's gonna be very helpful to have a boost in income for our housing authority. But most importantly, it really distresses me when I find out about residents that they will not have housing assistance if they move out of their public housing apartment. They'll have to start from the beginning. So our commission um, has charged me to expedite uh, this process with HUD, which is a little bit of an oxymoron, but you know, I will, I will forge through being the grant writer that I am. Um, and, I, and I am very, very confident. I know other housing authorities have done this repositioning and it's been very successful. So our commission is also looking forward to getting into other affordable housing opportunities. I have no idea what that looks like. If the county were to approach us and say, listen, we have this land and, and we know your track record, it's gonna be a procurement and a solicitation, but do you want to apply to build a public, or excuse me, not public, <laughs> Section 8 uh, affordable housing on the, uh, if, we, if we give the land to the deal? I, we will say absolutely yes. So those are the kinds of things. Um, if there's uh, other land opportunities that we can come across, we will look into that. And the other thing about that is because our housing authority does not have millions in reserves, a way for us to purchase land will be to leverage our Section 8 housing uh, program with a bank and get our own uh, loan and so forth to, to purchase land to do this type of development. So Local Community Housing Corporation, I know my time is probably ending very shortly here, so I just wanted to mention that our Tarpon Springs Housing Authority also has a very vigorous, successful <laughs> nonprofit 501c3, and that's called Local Community Housing Corporation. Most of you know uh, the program uh, programs that we have, such as the Cops and Kids Youth Center and Homeshare Pinellas. Very simply, uh, Homeshare Pinellas, what is it? It is working with uh, residents of Pinellas County that have a home anywhere in the county um, that may have changed in their number of family members in their home. So they, they purchased a home, they took care of this home, um, they invested in it, and they've lived there for many years, if not decades, but now they're living alone in this two or three or four bedroom home. Um, we have homeowners in Homeshare Pinellas that have a home on Tier Verde, and they would like somebody to come in and rent a room. We also have people that have a mobile home and it's a two or three bedroom mobile home. And now they find themselves in a, in a pretty lonely uh, situation uh, that they would love the companionship of a renter. Uh, the average rent for Homeshare Pinellas, uh, it, it, there's no cost, there's no fees associated with the program at all. Um, the average rent is somewhere between 550 to 750, which is about half of market rate for one bedroom apartment. So Homeshare Pinellas is a great program. I also just want to mention that I just got word from uh, Pinellas County uh, Social Action Committee that Homeshare Pinellas was awarded $51,000 to cover personnel expenses and insurance and so forth so that we can keep that program going. So I'm elated that we got county funding. And then of course, Cops and Kids Zoo Center. Um, I want to share with you um, a recent award that we received, and many of you know about it, but I just wanted to show you this plaque. Um, the National Campaign for Grade Level Reading, we submitted an application uh, that included all the dynamics of our after school and summer camp program, and we were awarded one of the top 20 finalists uh, across the nation for amazing after school programming. So I'm, I'm so proud of the staff, amazing tenured staff. We take care of 75 youth. Most of them live in public housing or a very, very low income housing in the community. Um, so Cops and Kids Youth Center, I can't say enough about this man here, uh, Chief Young. He is my partner and I, am, I know he has my back. 
um, makes me tear up a little bit because I know if anything were to ever happen, he would be right there to give me advice and to guide me, and we, we'd do it together. So um, thank you so much for welcoming me to give a brief overview of our housing authority. I thank you for your appointments at commissioners. They are amazingly talented, and they have so much heart, and they've really supported all of our staff through all the ebbs and flows through the years. Um, I welcome any questions that you have, um, but I know your, your time is, is sacred also. Thank you, Ms. Red. I, I have a question for you. Uh, 501c3, which means that people can contribute money. Oh, yes. Okay. If you could give us a, uh, a, a way of getting in touch with you, your name, phone number, your office phone number, and of course, they can always reach you through uh, Police Chief Young. I know that for a fact, yes. but if you could do that right now. Yes, my email address is robin, R-O-B-B-I-N, dot red, R-E-D-D, -D, at tarpon, I usually spell it out, <laughs> housing.com. So it's real Thank you. simple. And, yes. uh, the, the other, and your phone number? Or is, uh, my personal cell and my work cell is 813-405-7005. So your office number would have been just fine, but thank you. That's okay. Um, That's okay. The, um, uh, you mentioned 71 apartments um, that were available. I, I may, be, may have missed that. Is that Eagle Ridge that we're talking about, or is that the old uh, number well, of apartments? The, 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 you're correct with the 71. We have 71 remaining public housing units in our portfolio, but we also have 71 apartments at Eagle Ridge. Okay. So Eagle Ridge, Oak Ridge, and the Villages, those are already repositioned uh, properties, and, and they are all except Section 8 vouchers. And then our remaining public housing does not accept Section 8. Right. And so that is what we're, we're um, going to do here is reposition would, those so that the residents have all the options that they would need when they're trying to decide on, on where to, you know. How are home. you doing with filling the Eagle Ridge? Is it almost full? Oh, uh, it's, it's been full since March, okay. March uh, 21. Uh, and that's one of the things. Every single Monday I get a report of how many vacancies and turnovers we have. And we normally have one apartment that's changing over to a new resident. We never have vacancies. There's wait list. Um, and so just like many other cities and counties are, or all across the nation, um, we have a crisis. We had a crisis before the pandemic. Uh, there's not enough housing to house our population. That's it. We need more apartments, more homes, and more options. Tiny homes, mobile homes, apartments, studios above retail. You know, when I look at downtown Tarpon Springs, I think, hmm, retail on the <laughs> bottom, some residences on the top, um, get some young professionals and businesses to come in here, and, and, um, and, and families that are downsizing, you know, you've got, uh, very professional people and, and front, uh, first responders that live all over the county, but they want to downsize. It would be nice for them to, to move, you know, the, the last couple decades of their life to move to Tarpon Springs and have a nice little studio apartment, you know, one bedroom apartment. That would be really nice. Okay. So I think the city can serve everyone, but it's got to be creative and innovative uh, in order to do that. Thank you, Ms. Red. Let me go to the commissioners. Uh, Vice Mayor Lunt, do you have any comments? Um, I always am in awe of your enthusiasm, your fortitude, and just the strict management capabilities you're bringing to this, Robin. So you know where I feel. I'm 110% behind you in anything you do, but thanks. Thank Commissioner, you. Commissioner thank you. Carr. Sure, thank you for the presentation. It's great to see you again. Good to see uh, you again. Thanks for everything you're doing for the residents. For Are sure. you happy with all the landscaping at Eagle Ridge? Absolutely. Oh, it, looks, it looks incredible out there. <laughs> it's a we complete had a list. We had a list of all the great plants that are good for the community. Yes, good. Thank you. Yes, we hope to be doing some more work here uh, more intimately with the city because we're very excited about the commitment to help us build a new Cops and Kids Youth Center. We've always had a wait list, and we don't want to have a wait list, and we want to bring more youth in and more diversity within our program. We need more space. And we have solid funding from the Department of Juvenile Justice and the Juvenile Welfare Board to serve more kids. And so let's let's do it. We're excited about doing that in the future. Thank you. Um, Absolutely. Commissioner Eisen. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Robin. Um, I also am 110% behind you. 
Um, I just am enthused with your enthusiasm and if there's anything we can do to help. Uh, I really would like to uh, sit down and see how the commission and the city can help you um, because I, I do know it's getting harder and harder to have uh, homes, you know, and everybody deserves a warm place to stay. Mm -hmm. So thank you for what you do. I appreciate you. I appreciate Thank, thank you. you. And I, I want to just take a moment to thank um, Mark LaCorza's staff. All the projects that we have done, Oak Ridge and the Villages and Eagle Ridge, there are many, many staff within the city that push those papers and code enforcement and, and, and zoning and, I mean, a lot of volume of work that, that Tarpon Springs Housing Authority has created for uh, the staff of the city. And I, I've always heard amazing things about their support and turning things around so that we can get that unit filled up, but it's gotta be approved and inspected and, and the fire chief too, um, just, just amazing. So thank you, Mark, for everything that you do to support your staff because they support us awesomely. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Kulias. Hi, Robin. Thank you for everything you do from Oak Ridge to Eagle Ridge and, and what they've come to what they were before. And uh, I had the pleasure of taking uh, someone from the Pinellas Community Foundation over to the Cops and Kids Center, and it was perfect time. All the kids were there, and it was just no one can doubt your passion and enthusiasm for our housing authority. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. I'm going to retire here. <laughs> no. City Manager LaCour, since you were called out by name, <laughs> would you like to say anything? No, I just want to thank you very much for partnering with us and all you've done and brought the center forward. Thank you. All right. And Chief, I don't want to leave you out. I just You're okay. looking forward to continue working with you and the great things for the Cops and Kids program for years to come. Thank you, Chief. All right. Thank you. Now we're going to go to the uh, residents, the audience that is here. Uh, does anyone have any public comments uh, concerning this matter? Ms. Red, if you can just, yes, thank you very much. Good evening, Peter Lax, 514 Ashland Avenue. Thank you, Mrs. Red. You shared some valuable information to us. You mentioned about land. Well, I happened to drive by Mango today and it is impressive the way that area has changed but there's 40 lots for sale right next door to the old mango circle <coughs> I guess it's called Eagle Crest it was on sale previously by owner but now it's a broker so if you need to go through you're gonna end up having to pay commissions but I was thinking with the ARCA funds is there not a, a portion that can be done for affordable housing where we purchase the land, transfer it to the housing authority, and then they work on grants to build stuff there. So that that was a thought that popped into my head. Well, the one next door? Let's uh, keep up with the comments. Okay, well, those of us who weren't aware of that, thanks for the update. <laughs> um, also, one thing that I was curious about to get maybe a little further explanation as Ms. Red was explaining that the way this process about getting these other people Section 8 vouchers that those who used them immediately to move would get reimbursed but those later <coughs> wouldn't. So my question in my mind is what's, why is there an incentive to get people moving out quicker versus later and What's, what's the advantage? Is it free up more units for fixing up? So that was the only thing I kind of had a dichotomy on because on one, you're trying to get the residents to have more options, but it sounded like you're trying to incentivize them to, to leave. But otherwise, I think uh, with the housing situation we have, I just got the latest Business Observer 500 facts and businesses and they added a new section about affordable housing and what Ms. Red mentioned is other options we have to look at. I know in times we've talked about granny houses, houses on top of garages. And to me, uh, Manatee Village, I said it then, that was a perfect opportunity to revitalize that area, take it out, 
put retail, put your apartments or townhomes on the top. That at this point is gone, but there's other areas in the city that can uh, take advantage of that. So I hope uh, the people who would have interest in doing those things would look at those options as far as the viability of increasing uh, the affordable housing space within our city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delacus. Are there any other public comments this evening? Just as Ms. Robin had just spoke to y'all about the city and the cops and kids and the housing, I'm gonna speak to you concerning the African-American community. I'm not an advocate for Mark LaCourse at all, and I speak for myself and amongst a lot of other people. It's 270 people had hit me up in email. It was brought to my attention because I hadn't been in the city meetings forever. And they said that we was looking to replace and get a new city manager. So I asked the people, I said, well, what is the problem? What is Mark doing? What is happening? It came to my attention. They said, well, you know, they said they were gonna change the city board. They're gonna just change some stuff. I said, well, when they got on city councilor, that was the change. They wanted to vote. They moved the people out. Mark is one person, but many people answered to him. So I went around, I spoke, and I talked to people, and I do want everybody to understand. I'm African-American. I don't speak for the whole African-American. But I've been in this community for 54 years. I didn't fought with Mark LaCourse more than anybody, physical, on paper, and anything else. But I also know that he's a fair person. He got an open door concept, and he's going to listen. You may not get what you want, but he's going to be accessible to you. He's going to bring it to the attention. So I'm just saying, because I don't know when you hear rumors, you address it. So I told 273 people today that I was going to go to the city, I was going to bring it to the city attention, that um, if we have a problem, you know, we fix it. If we don't, let's not just move a person to say just for change. Nobody's going to be in a position in a job for 10, 12 years and not make a mistake. But through trial and error, if you make up and you learn from that and you move forward, then let's not hang you on the cross and punish you for it. We, the African American, as just Robin was just speaking about the city, I'm going to speak about that. We over there, we didn't see Mark hit the ground, walking, knocking on doors. We seen when things went right, he come and say, "Hey, you gonna calm down? We gonna do it the right way? Bring it to me, present it to me, let me investigate." Cause he used to be an officer, so he know how to investigate. I don't want nobody to think because I'm up here and I'm speaking on the matter. I don't want the board to get together and move Mark out faster and decide cause they got the voting power to do just that. I think we have to be very careful when we decide that we're just looking for a city manager just for the sake of saying we need a city manager. Because a lot of things in this community, we run a close knit. You didn't heard Robin, I was just at the hospital, I was just in this community. I went and spoke to a lot of these city employees. A lot of them say, hey, I didn't have my ups and downs with Mark, but I won't work for nobody else. If he leaves, I may be leaving. That's just a conversation. That's not the whole us down to the thumb of contact. It's just a conversation. I just want to say to the board member that up on the, your leadership, if you feel and you decide that you have to go and you speak amongst each other that, hey, we do need a new city manager, a good city manager used last four or five, that's BS. Because I Googled and I seen where some cities got city managers been there 30 years plus, over 20 cities, 30 years or plus. That tells me something. They know their job, they know what they're getting, and they're continuing to move forward. I'm saying to this board, just like we voted you in, we the people, if we're not satisfied with the board members doing, we can vote you out. And that's not a bad thing, a, a threat of coming at you any kind of way. I just want to say that we just have to be careful when we just move people to move people. And I'm saying to the residents, I'm saying to the board members, if somebody decide that we need another city manager just for the sake of it, Ask ourselves, what have Mark been doing up under this new leadership? Have we been following what need been doing? Have we been communicating? Have we been getting back? Have we been doing? Have we been serving? If the answer is yes, then the answer should be yes, we should stay. I want to make it clear. I'm not an advocate for Mark. I'm, I'm an advocate for what's right. I'm an advocate for when people sit there and they tell me something, I investigate, and then I see that it's going left. I'm not going to sit down. 
I don't do like I used to do. I'm not going to jump up and stream a stick with chest. Out. That's not going to get us in it. Well, we'll just have the chief holding me down. But we're going to move forward. I just want to tell the board that I serve a community way, and to the fairness of y'all, that some of y'all are new up here. But I serve a community where over the years, I done seen Mark participate in Martin Luther King. I done seen him participate in the Epiphany. I done seen him go to the schools. I done seen him go to some people that had crisis. So it ain't just a certain community that he just playing fiddle to, it's who he is. And it ain't just one community he's serving. As the city chief, he don't belong to one person. He belongs to the right. city. Mr. Reynolds, that beeper was your I'm time. sorry. I appreciate That's it. That's okay. I just ask it's that always you please good to hear from you. Consider it, and I'm going to respect the time gap. But I ask that if we're going forward, let's keep moving forward with Mr. LaCourse. And I think the people are bite me up during the voting season on that. Thank you, sir. Are there any other uh, public comments related to the Housing Authority presentation? Uh, IT, are there any um, remote access comments? If anyone online would like to, to speak on, this, on these items, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in. And we do not have any raised hands at this time, sir. Okay, and I know we do not have any emails that came in this afternoon. So, um, Ms. Robin Red, thank you very much for the presentation, and it's always good to hear from you and getting an update on what's going on in the Tarpon Springs Housing Authority. I very much appreciate, like everyone else, is that you're expanding your services to help other than just housing, uh, daycare, and other things like that. So, thank you very much. Um, let's go to. Uh, public comments now, just regular public comments on anything that's not on the agenda. Chris Roboski, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. Uh, so since Trask Dagno LLC has terminated its contract with the city. I would normally assume that Mr. Trask and Mr. Dagno would file a motion to withdraw as counsel to all litigation which they currently represent the city. This can be done by motion filed with the court along with a request that the court grant the city 30 to 45 days to retain substitute counsel. They should be specifically directed to do that by the city commission, unless they've already agreed to do so or agreed to do so tonight. They should also be directed not to file any further pleadings except the notice of withdrawal. Now, the attorneys might argue that it would cost a lot of money uh, to get new counsel up to speed on these lawsuits, but that's okay because we have a new commission which might wanna take a different direction with the litigation and if the firm has lost confidence with the city and the city has lost confidence, vice versa, there should be no question that the withdrawal should take place immediately so the city can start looking for litigation counsel. It's also important to know that the city doesn't have to use its city attorney for this litigation. There could be a separate decision on who to substitute as litigation counsel, and who should be the city attorney. So if this hasn't taken place, by all means, it needs to take place very soon. Uh, the, the, apparently, there was some issue with this in Dunedin, and they stayed on for a period of time representing the city, even after they had left. So you do not want this to happen in Tarpon especially with the Concerned Citizens lawsuit and with Mr. Colson. Mr. Dagno ought not to be handling that anymore and needs to be notified that uh, he needs to file this withdrawal. So I hope that this has already taken place. Certainly don't wait till the last day on the 9th of the 30 days, do it now the court on notice and also that thing that Dagno 
drafted and sent in that said that it was indefensible or was not going to defend the stay that you all voted on, that court needs to be notified that that's no longer the city's position. And the sooner you meet with another attorney and get some legal counsel about all your options, the better. So you got to do it right away. You got to get another attorney's opinion right away so you know all of your options. I mean, they, they've already said they're going. So something has to be done. It has to be done right away. Especially with the two cases that I just mentioned. They, they, they can't be trusted to handle those cases anymore. Not to mention if they proceed to defend the city in these matters, they would no longer be under contract at their contracted rate. So I'm assuming that that could change as well. So these are issues, hopefully this has been addressed and if it was not, I mean, don't wait. You, you guys can insist on it tonight. You can tell them that this needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Robosky. It's a, a very new revelation, three business days old. There's a whole lot of details that need to be worked out. Um, we'll be getting to that um, as we go along. I know there's got to be a lot of communication in that regard. Thank you. Mayor? Next comment, please. Mr. Geddes? Mayor? Oh, uh, Mr. Moore, yes. Can I address that just to stymie of course, any please. potential additional content, maybe uh, streamline the conversation? Our firm has withdrawn. Uh, from or, or communicated our intent to uh, terminate the contract. We have already communicated our intention to coordinate with the city manager. Um, notices of substitution of counsel in those cases in which we represent the city uh, in our capacity as city attorney. Uh, um, additionally to that, I would uh, suggest that it is a fundamental misrepresentation that there was an issue with that in any other community. We have never represented a community against its will. Um, I, moreover, uh, as it relates to the city of Dunedin, there was a case that we continued representing them in at their request. Um, upon our separation, we continued to litigate that case, prevailed at the trial court, had it appealed to the 11th Circuit, and had an order issued the same day of his oral argument in the city's favor. Uh, we, we defend our clients' positions, we advance them and fulfill our ethical obligations. We understand the city and the, and the firm's intent to part ways as city attorney, and we will respect that. We are working with your city administrators and staff to, uh, to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to work through the substitution so that we fulfill our ethical obligations and ensure you always have counsel, um, but also expeditiously um, extricate ourselves from that litigation in which we are no longer needed as counsel. Thank you, Mr. Moore. I'm, I'm personally confident that it's going to work out in that regard, so I'm not, um, I don't have an issue with that. Um, Mr. Geddes, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live at uh, 802 Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Um, in regards to last uh, meeting, August 23rd, there was a spirited discussion concerning a privilege fee. And I know that as an audience member, my perspective is most likely limited due to my lack of insight in and on such political matters. Um, in regards to such privilege fee issues. Um, but I do know that I am in direct opposition and I object to the Pinellas County reclaimed water availability fee um, in that such fee takes my essential water supply hostage to support an ad hoc third party facility bond contrivance in statute 15311 in effect such fee is the manifestation of a toll charge taxing my access to my vital water supply and rate making my water access converting my water access um, into a privilege and um, based on Pinellas County uh, Resolution 95286, my water supply is now considered a privilege to access. And I feel as though that my human rights um, in regards to my vital water supply um, have been disrupted um, and denied in light of such fee as 
as contrived now. As far as how the reclaim water availability fee relates to last meeting's discussion of a, a privilege fee, um, I'm not so sure if I know the nexus between an availability fee or, or the difference between a, a privilege fee, um, but I, um, I, 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 I have done some research um, in regards to as a fee um, structuring, and, and I found a court case that, that might be interest uh, to the board um, in regarding to constitutionalities of, of fee structures. Um, that I, I handed out um, to your officer before the meeting, and um, I just thought I'd present that to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Geddes. Are there any other public comments? Commissioners, Mayor, guests, residents. So, 514 Ashland Avenue, if I forgot. A couple of things, I'm gonna read something here for you. And then we're gonna get into uh, the basis of my comments. This will be Deuteronomy 32, various verses. The Lord saw this and rejected them because he was angered by his sons and daughters. <clears throat> I will hide my face for them, he said, and see what their end will be. For a fire has been kindled in my wrath, one that burns to the realm of death below. It will devour the earth and its harvest and set afire the foundations of the <clears throat> mountains. I will heap calamities upon them and spend my <coughs> arrows against them. It is mine to avenge. I will repay. In due time, their foot will slip. Their day of disaster is near, and their doom rushes upon them. I lift my hand to heaven and forever declare as I live forever, when I sharpen my sword and my hand, grasps it in judgment. I will take vengeance on my adversaries and repay those who hate me. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. He will take vengeance on his enemies and make atonement for his land and people. <clears throat> now, that's kind of some of the issues that uh, I want to discuss. Uh, Mr. Geddes was talking about uh, the privilege fee, but he doesn't understand what that was about. Uh, it's about vacations. And if any of you would like to get the background on this, if you go to the city commissioner's agenda, go down to the meeting of August 23rd, click it, go down about halfway, you'll see the backup on this item. I sent the board to y'all. Uh, Link to a vacation I found in the Business Observer. Proposed petition to vacate. Uh, no by its Board of County Commissioners, 30 September, blah, blah, blah. A portion of land in the Tampa and Tarpon Springs Land Company. Ooh. Doesn't describe the property. I was curious, so I did some research. I checked up on it. And basically, it's out on Highland Avenue by McAlpin where they're doing the work. They did a land swap. <coughs> County gave Mr. McAlpin's trust some land. The trust gave the county some land, land swap. Now, here's where I want to kind of get into something here. If you go back to that agenda item and look at it, you'll see in the emails there how an outside attorney perpetrated a scheme to change that prior, that vacation fee. And it has cost us since. And I've told you all about it when Pioneer Development was building that property out on the corner of Mellon and Jasmine. And here's what I'm going to explain to you in numbers. The city gave a 15 by 620 foot right-of-way, which is equal to 9,300 square feet. 
The pioneer development people said their smallest lots were 3,500 feet. So 9,300 square feet equals to 2.657 lots that the city gave, gave to them. Now, in the backup, uh, Mayor uh, Vaticiotis had put in a formula where if you took either eight to $12 and <coughs> timed it by 80% by the square footage, you would get a valuation. So 9,300 square feet at $8 times the 80% comes out to 59,000. If you took the top level, 9,300 square feet at $12 came out to 111,600 and you take 80%, that was 89,000. If you take the medium, it was about 75,000. $75,000 that an outside attorney cost the city. I know my time's up. Thank you, Mr. Law. Just want to make y'all aware of some of the other stuff that's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nice Delacus. to see you, Katie. <laughs> are there any other public comments? IT, are there any remote access comments this evening? If anyone would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time, sir. Thank you. We're going to proceed. That ends. That closes public comments. Uh, let's proceed to the consent agenda. Uh, we have 14 items on that. Item one: satisfaction and release of liens. Item two: attorneys' fees. Trash Dagnall invoice, September 1st, 2022. Item three: authorized execution of Second Amendment to Senior Micro Transit Funding Agreement. Item four. Ratified Memorandum of Understanding with the International Association of Firefighters. Item five, Ratified Memorandum of Understanding with the Suncoast Police Benevolent Association. Item six, Approved Revised Fiscal Year 2023 Internal Audit Plan. Item seven, Authorized Execution of Letter Rescinding JAG <coughs> Grant Funding for 2021. Item eight, Authorized Execution of update, Updated JAG Grant for 2022. Item nine, increase file number 170113-C-CM for food products and supplies. Item 10, renew file number 210081-C-AM, routine maintenance and repairs for maintaining um, the highway lights. Item 11, increase file number 200056-Q-JL, janitorial, janitorial services for the cultural services building. Item 12, increase file number 220010-N-AM and award file number 230010-NAS, beverages for resale. Item 13, award file number 230004-N-AS, single source purchase of rugged machine to machine gateway in um, uh, global positioning system routers, accessories and maintenance and services. Item 14, award bid number 220159-B-JL, asphalt material, crushed. Um, or do any commissioners wish to pull any of the items? Uh, Commissioner Eisner. Number two and 12, please. Two and 12? Please. Okay. On, on my right, any commissioners want to pull anything? Okay, so um, Vice Mayor Lawn, I assume you don't? Nothing? Okay. Um, what I'd like to do is have a, um, a motion and a second on items 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, and 14 for approval. Motion to approve. I'll okay. second. Okay. Um, let's go to... Um, uh, public comments. Are there any public comments on any of these items? IT, are there any remote access public comments on any of these items? If anyone online would like to speak on these items, please raise your hand. You'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time, sir. Thank you. Um, I assume there's no uh, commission comments, so roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, Commissioner Eisner, if you'd like to start off with attorney's fees, number two. <clears throat> yes, I would. Thank you, Mayor. 
Um, this is just a observation, and I just wanted to um, make you aware of the uh, Trask Dagenham build in July was in and around 30,000. In August, it was 20, and this month, it was 15.5. That's pretty much always just for information purposes. Okay. okay. Thank you. You just wanted to get that detail out there? Yes. Okay. Um, are there any other commission comments com concerning that matter? What, was there like a lot of extra litigation going on, meetings that that were going on a few months ago and it just dropped down to 15,000 recently or? Are you asking me? Yeah, I, I didn't, I wasn't able to look back and compare them. Well, I'm just giving you the facts. I'm not the person that would okay. have to answer that. You know? All right, thank you. Yeah. Mr. Moore, do you have anything you'd like to offer on that? I'd only offer that the time entries speak for themselves. I understand. Okay, uh, I'd like to have a, uh, let's go to public comment on that item. Are there any other public comments? Chris Roboski, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. So, I've already spoken to you about this. But I think it's incumbent on the city to determine how much travel expenses was actually billed to the city for at least the last two to three years, which is what a key TAM provision would, would do if the citizens did that. But the commission can do it. It's important to remember that the cost provision of their contract seems to indicate that they're entitled to costs or out-of-pocket costs, not billing at an hourly rate. The contract provision is as follows. Only costs incurred are reimbursed. Ch charging an hourly rate for travel is not a cost incurred. The city shall pay all costs incurred or advanced by the firm in representing the city pursuant to this agreement. Such costs include, but are not limited to, court filing fees, deposition charges, photocopying, long distance telephone charges, FedEx charges, out of county travel, charges, computer research <laughs> fees, and other out-of-pocket costs. So you could figure out how much they overbilled and just ask them to cut a check before they leave. It's not going to hurt you to do that, and the city will get back money. It's like Mr. Delacco said, another attorney costs us $72,000. Um, this is money you can get back, and I'm told by many uh, attorneys that they don't want this to go to court they don't want to get sued over this so they will cut you a check but they're not going to do it unless you ask them to so you know you guys could do that save the citizens a lot of work I know there wasn't a lot of you know, jumping up and down about this except for one commissioner but I mean all you gotta do is ask Maybe they'll cut the check, maybe they won't. It's not gonna hurt you to ask them to get the citizens their money back. I mean, it's tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. They were charging their hourly rate for like $5 in gas from Clearwater to here. And that's times every board, not just this one. So just consider asking them and just see where it goes. It's not going to hurt anybody, and they can't quit twice. They already quit. So just ask them for the money. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rubofsky. Anita Protus, 901 Bayshore Drive, former mayor, commissioner for many years. I am sorry we're losing Mr. Trask and that form uh, that uh, uh, law firm after all the years. You know, Mr. Herboski has made a lot of accusations and there, no one on this board has asked him to prove them. Ask him what attorneys told him that. Mr. Trask wasn't gonna come here and cheat us out of money. <clears throat> He's a prominent law, law, lawyer in, in, in Pinehouse County. You don't see any of the other uh, communities going after him this way. This is embarrassing to us. And it smells, we know why it's happening. 
and you are going to have to hold the burden for it. Yeah. Well, <coughs> let, let me just say, you know, <laughs> everybody's got an opinion on this matter, and the fact is, um, it the particular item concerning time for travel has never been resolved. It's not been discussed. It's not been voted on. And I don't know that we're going to have an opportunity to do that. I'm, uh, we have a, um, a, a, a letter from uh, Mr. Trask concerning his uh, agreement with the city that came in last Friday. And as of right now, we're just going to work through that and try and get re everything resolved as far as any loose ends with the city's business and litigation and all of that, rather than um, talking about travel time. I I'm, may... Uh, um, it may be something that uh, some residents don't want to hear from me, but right now there's too many things on the table to be talking about travel time concerning legal uh, um, uh, businesses and also the litigation that we've got ongoing. If we ever have some time to get to that, we will. But as of right now, I wouldn't support it. I, if a commission wishes to put that on an agenda in some future date, they can. They have that right to do. It's a policy item. but. For me right now, given the comments that I've heard tonight, um, I'm, I'm not prepared to do that, but of course any other commissioner can. Um, Mr. Moore, do you have anything to say? No, sir. Okay. Um, let's move on to other public comments. Are there any other public comments? IT, are there any uh, public comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I know that um, Commissioner Eisner had an opportunity to speak on this item. Commissioner Kulias asked a question, or I didn't really ask any of the other commissioners whether they have anything or is there any follow-up from anybody concerning this matter? Okay, may I have a, um, a motion to approve item two and a second, please? Motion to approve item two. <coughs> Is there a second? Second. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lent? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Item 12, um, Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> um, the only thing I want to speak about with this is when we get these type of um, increases, could we also get a, a breakdown of, um, because in the backup material, it just says that there's been an uptick, you know, uptick in the amount of people, but we don't know what that means. So um, did it double, did it triple? Uh, just want to know if the costs have gone up due to the uh, cost of the items or is it, because it said that there were a lot of rounds um, golf done, but I, I don't understand what that means. We'll be selling 300, now we're selling 600. So just on any of these type things, I, I only wanted to use this as an example, but any time that we have an uptick of funds, I'd like to know what it attributes to. That's all. <coughs> okay. Um, City Manager, of course, you want to mention, do you want to say anything? No, I, I understand, and, uh, okay. and we will do that. All right. Um, you're not prepared to address it this evening, though, is that correct? I don't think, Paul, that you... I just wanted to make sure yeah. that there was anything yeah. additional information. Good Paul Smith, Public Services Director. Um, I do appreciate the feedback. I just will say generally this request here is asking for an increase in the authorization. It's not asking necessarily for an increase in spending, just the ability to purchase up to that amount to get us through the end of the year. Business is up. Uh, summer is usually a really slow period, but um, it's sustained. Um, and because of that, we need to keep providing the supplies and then those are funded through the revenue of the sale. Does that help? Thank you, Paul. I, I understand what that is. It's just um, I would like to know what the numbers are. Um, I understand it's a, uh, just adding to what we can use. <coughs> but thank you. I okay. always appreciate you. Yeah. Alrighty. Are there any other commissioner comments on this item? Uh, any public comments on this item? 
IT, are there any uh, remote access comments on this item? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed into the dock. And we do not have any raised hands at this time, sir. Thank you. Um, there are no other commission comments. Um, I have a motion to approve item 12 in a second, please. Motion to approve item 12. Second. Roll call. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, it's 7.30. We're going to shift over to our <coughs> ordinances and resolutions. And um, we're going to start with item 23, resolution 2022-35. Um, Mr. Moore, if you could read the resolution by title only, please. Happily, Mr. Mayor. This is resolution number 2022-35, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, supporting a solar cooperative in the City of Tarpon Springs, providing consent to Solar United Neighbors of, the, of Florida for the use of the city seal and providing for an effective date hereof. This has been a reading of resolution number 2022-35 by title only. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, let's go to City Manager LaCours for a presentation. The staff presentation, please. Thank you. Good evening, Paul Smith, Public Services Director. This is one of two items on the agenda tonight regarding solar. We're uh, very excited to bring to you. Um, this particular one has to do with providing more opportunities to our community to have solar energy put on their homes. And I will say I can speak to this as an actual customer of one of these co-ops. It really worked out well for me. And uh, I'm glad that this opportunity is back for you to consider approving our support of. Um, staff has been working on this. I'm going to ask Robin, our sustainability coordinator, Robin Reeves, to come up and give you a brief presentation about what the program's about. Thank you, Robin. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I'm Robin, the sustainability coordinator. We've met a couple times before. Happy to be here to talk about this item. Um, so as Paul mentioned, there are two items tonight regarding solar. This is a separate effort from the other item um, regarding solar tonight. Um, and as Paul mentioned, this item is meant for residents. Um, so while it's not for the city itself, it helps residents of the city of Tarpon Springs to have access to information and competitive pricing for solar panel installations. <clears throat> Uh, the Florida Solar United Neighbors Sun is a nonprofit organization which expands access to solar by sharing information with Floridians about the benefits of distributed solar energy and they help to organize these group solar installations. And tonight we have uh, the, golf course, uh, the Gulf Coast Program Associate from Sun, Julia Herbst, here in the audience and she can help answer any questions you may have later on. Um, just to provide an overview, the purpose of these solar co-ops, um, they are voluntary groups and they purchase solar power or solar systems in bulk and uh, that's a way that makes solar power more affordable and accessible um, because by purchasing solar panels or solar systems in a large cooperative, installers are able to give discounted prices um, and that results in savings for the cooperative members. Um, so this enables community members to make informed decisions regarding the purchase of solar power and it provides them education and resources. Um, Co-op members can participate on a voluntary basis. They do not have to purchase solar at any point during their participation in this program. And throughout the duration of the co-op, Sun provides administrative and technical assistance to those members. Um, this is a benefit to the city's residents, again, because it gives them access to information and support as they um, explore solar, and it provides them with competitive pricing. Um, it's also a benefit to the city because it allows us to help promote solar in our community in a manner that is low pressure and um, without requiring a cost commitment for residents. Um, additionally, Sun is able to provide data tracking. Uh, they're able to calculate and track the numbers of participants and the estimated cost savings, energy savings, and all kinds of additional benefits, such as benefits to our local economy. And they can calculate this both at the county level and specifically for our city. 
Um, other cities participating in this Pinellas County Co-op this year include the City of Dunedin, City of Safety Harbor, City of Largo, City of St. Pete, and City of Clearwater. The City of Clearwater is the financial sponsor for this event. Uh, this is something that we have done before. The City of Tarpon Springs uh, participated in a similar Sun Pinellas County Co-op in 2017 along with the City of Dunedin and City of Safety Harbor and our participation would be non-financial. We would simply be promoting the cohort opportunity, uh, sharing information about it, including information about their information sessions to our residents through actions such as posting on the city's Facebook page and sustainability website, having flyers in city facilities, and we would allow Sun to utilize the city's logo in their promotional outreach materials. Um, so tonight we're asking for the uh, Board of Commissioners to agree for the City of Tarpon Springs to join on this initiative as a community partner through adopting Resolution 2022-35. Thank you, Ms. Reeves. Thank you. Mr. Smith, do you have anything else to add? Uh, thank you, Mayor here. I'm just here to help with any questions. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's go to public comments on this. Um, this has to do with additional solar panels at the um, RO plant or reverse osmosis water plant. No, 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 no. no, no. This one is a separate item. This is the, this is the support no, of the co-op, the resolution authorizing, oh. endorsing the co-op's efforts and uh, authorizing use of the seal for a limited I'm sorry, I apologize. That's in the, um, the other one is in the um, special consent. I got it, okay. Multiple solar ones tonight. Are there any? public comments on this anyway. <laughs> Hello and thank you commissioners. I'm actually Julia Herps with Solar United Neighbors. I'm also a Tarpon resident. Uh, at 1132 Elmendorf Trace um, and also a solar owner. Um, and I actually discovered Solar United Neighbors here in this room during an information session. So I thank you for support of clean energy and this opportunity to give your residents education over what is a very complex subject and a long-term investment. So um, this is a real good way to promote education and investment in private property as well as a lot of community benefits. So thank you for considering this, and I'm also here for any responses or questions. Thank you. Mr. Delacus. Thank you. Peter Delacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. Uh, anything we can do to alleviate or reduce the reliance of our residents on Duke Energy and the corporate power companies is to everybody's benefit. More dollars in their pocket, more they can spend on other things. Basically what they're asking is to join them in a partnership. It's a voluntary group. And uh, as those people become more aware, as she mentioned, the buying power helps. So. One of my things, and I was gonna, was, had looked earlier on number 16 with regards to the uh, additional solarization of the reverse osmosis plant that Paul knows I and we have talked about a lot. Well, on that contract, I think it's about 1.3 million and about 800,000 of it is for panels and stuff. So I don't know if maybe somehow our buying power with number 16 can be leveraged to this group so they can pass on any purchasing power savings for the volunteer co-op residents. So I don't know, I'm just kind of throwing that out as I think about it, but anything we can do to uh, help the residents uh, get unhooked from the power companies and, and their manipulations of what they do, I mean, <laughs> if you look at your bill, you see that asset securitization charge? People know what that is? That's, we're still paying for the Florida power, or Florida progress is messing up the Crystal River power plant. And 
commission, and <laughs> got to tell you, Chris Sprouse, he had come to a meeting years ago when he was first running, and he promised that he was going to do everything he could to get rid of that fee. That happened? No. But he got the Speaker of the House, so that's just an aside. So anything you can do to support solar, I've said it before, we've got all of our buildings, flat roofs, use this purchasing power to expand as much as we can and reduce the cities. And lastly, <laughs> I drove out to the uh, Anklote River Park the other day just to take a look about what's going on out there again. And you pass Stauffer, <laughs> that property's still for sale. If we could buy it, put on our old solar panels, we could generate enough electricity, the city wouldn't have to pay Duke for anything else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delarcus. Anita Protus, 901 Bayshore Drive, another accusation made. Yes, Chris Sprouse did become Speaker of the House, but if you do your research, he tried to get the fee out and didn't have the support. We need to start looking at accusations being made to the commission to make sure they have a backup. <clears throat> there are any other public comments? IT, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. have any raised hands at this time, sir. Thank you. Um, let's go to the uh, commission. Do um, um, Vice Mayor Lunt, do you have any comments on this? Yeah, I have a, a, a couple of questions and a comment. Um, so to my understanding, uh, there's a minimum requirement of people that, are, that have to join this co-op. Is it 20 or 21 households to actually make the co-op go? Um, Julia, would you like to speak to that? I can answer that if you'd like. It's 20. It's 20? Okay. Pull that out of my head. All right. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> so, also, so if they don't make this 20, it kind of dissolves and, and, and goes its own way. Um, in the particular co-ops that we're talking about are specific to the Tarpon Springs area or Northern Pinellas or or are there any definitions of how broadly this co-op is going to be adopted? So this is a Pinellas County-wide co-op, uh, so any resident of the county can participate. And I believe that the co-op is currently at 36 members, so they've exceeded that Oh, okay, 20. so it's well along in its way. Right. Um, Okay, so uh, anyway, those are the only questions I had, but I just wanted to make a comment that I, I think this is a good idea for the residents. Um, I know it's a, it's a difficult decision and pretty complex subject to approach with most residents. Um, and any sort of outside, more, in, more uh, educated opinions that they can get and, and more data is probably better because I'm a pretty detailed guy and I've sorted through this stuff several times myself. It's not an uncomplex uh, situation. Anything we can do to help the residents out is, uh, is great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Carr. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, happy to support it. Supported it back in 2017. Um, anything we could do to help the residents with buying power uh, makes sense. Uh, thank you for bringing this forward and making another option for the residents. A couple quick questions I have since we're talking about solar here with Mark. Um, Mark, I did ask, or city manager, I did ask about um, looking into doing solar panels for the buildings throughout the city. Um, it's been a few years, but then we talked further about it, and I think you had some staff members looking into that. Do you have any update on that at all? Mm -hmm. Paul, you want to? <clears throat> really not a whole lot different than what I mentioned to you, I think about two or three months ago. 
really we're going for the low hanging fruit now. Um, this item later in your agenda, the RO facility, we've got plans already. We've gone through the selection process, so we're really uh, recommending that to you. That's gonna make a big difference. Some of these other ideas of the flat roofs here, and, and those will be much smaller capacities, but there's gonna be a whole structural roofing component to those that'll have to be evaluated. And I think that's gonna take the cost feasibility probably in the wrong direction, but nonetheless, I do think we need to look at it, and particularly any um, newer projects that are coming up on the horizon. Thanks, Paul. No further questions yeah. or comments? Commissioner Eisner. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. So I'm happy to answer any question because I had a conversation with um, Heaven Campbell for quite some time because I was very concerned about putting our seal on anything. So I think I asked almost every question you could possibly come up with because I am not a candidate for solar. I, I, I feel I'm too old to reclaim the benefit. And it was just, I, I do want to talk about the co-op program though. I'm, I'm a supporter of it. The co-op program is there to help all people, not only in the purchase of, but in the repair of, um, I had a resident who called me to try to get help because they had a solar installation and the person wouldn't do the final hookup, so they were kind of left holding the bag and they didn't know which way to go. Um, the, your, your company, or whoever this is, will take that over. They have installers, they have repair people. Um, so they do this um, in, in bulk. That's literally how this functions. Um, they get together 20 people. When they get 20 people, they go out and they try to find a solar company that would be willing to bid on it. But they research, they do the background research, they do the interview. So they're doing everything. They're just a middle, middle person, um, you know, and being it's a 501c3, um, they're, they're really not in it for the money except for their own salary. So I, I am fully in support of this. I really didn't find a flaw in anything um, that Heaven had said to me. Uh, I know there was a question asked about us as a city getting involved, but I think our purchase power in the larger um, items, I think we have better purchase power than to go through a co-op and uh, to be involved, you know, commercial versus residential. So I hope that answered the question. Um, but I am, I, I do want to put our city seal on this. Um, I do think everybody should take advantage of it. I think it's a great idea. It, it helps purchase power for everybody across the board. So I want to thank you um, for bringing this forward. And that, that's pretty much it. So thank you. Commissioner Eisner, Commissioner Cuyas. Thank you, Mayor. I just had a couple questions about the competitive pricing and, and when you do come up with these co-ops, they're using di are they using different brands of solar panels? And, and I guess Commissioner Eisner talked about different installers as well. And and do they offer different financing options? Or are they funneled through uh, certain companies or not? Just wanted to get an idea on that. If I could start, I'm glad that uh, Julia is here to pick up on the details. I can just tell you my experience was the, uh, they have a selection committee and they vet the companies as the commissioner mentioned, Commissioner Eisner, and they also vet the equipment that they're proposing. So it really is a good way to get um, uh, a, a good sense of confidence in what you're um, offering out there to the community. But is there anything I missed? Yes, thank you. So Solar United Neighbors is a 501c3, so we have to remain vendor neutral. So we are committed to education and consumer protection. So how the installer is selected is a competitive bid process. The actual RFP is going to be released tomorrow. You're all welcome to look at that on the co-op website. It's a very extensive question of solar installers to bid to install solar for the members of the co-op, um, and it's based on various equipment that we check. It's very thorough RFP. It asks about pricing, equipment, things like battery storage as well, upgrade equipment, and warranties. So it's a very thorough as far as um, searching out the vendors. But again, we do education and we facilitate that selection process. We do not select the vendor, so the member team 
evaluates the criteria of the larger group. We hope to grow this group to 200 members and help as many people as possible. And that selection group of volunteers makes that selection. So it is no obligation to go solar, and it's very member driven. Okay. I just want to, are you are you waiting to get up to 200 before you can start? No, there's, we do not have to reach any kind of level to proceed or to get any pricing. So we've, in Florida alone, we've, we've had over 75 solar co-ops since 2015. This is the eighth in Pinellas County. So um, the bidders will bid on anticipating how many members will be in the group. Thank you, ma'am. No further questions. Thank you. I, I want to thank everybody for correcting me on which item we're on. Um, I did do a, a reset, and I do have a, a question concerning the use of the city seal. Uh, not just being careful, but there is a, I've gone through this before, there's a state statute on the use of city seals, and I asked um, Ms. Jacobs to pull that statute for me and, and handed it to Mr. Moore, and, and would there be any problem with using our city seal in this capacity? Um, I'm familiar with Florida Statute uh, 165.043 that the mayor just provided. Um, there would be an issue with using the seal were it without our consent. Uh, this body is, is giving its consent in the resolution. Uh, that, that consent has a, uh, you, it explicitly provides that the body can withdraw that consent so it is not interminable. Uh, so under those, um, on those basis it is permissible to proceed in that fashion and if the seal is misused or um, the use extends beyond the scope of what's contemplated, the city can take action. Okay. Um, can anyone describe as far as what the intent of the use of the seal is? I mean, it's very important to me because I've gone through this before with the number of people wanting to use the city seals that are not associated with the government. And it says, Mr. Moore describes sometimes it's used in a, in a way that the city may not want to have it, whatever is being done associated with the city. So I, I think I agree with Mr. Eisner, Commissioner Eisner, excuse me, sir, that uh, we need to be careful as far as granting permission for that. So um, if could somebody describe that to me? Yeah, there are generally two places where we use logos or seals, whether it's in the case of municipality. The first is on the website. The co-op website is a public um, interface that you can, it's up now with the other municipalities. The second place would be on outreach material, various flyers, social media. Um, sometimes we link to the cities or municipalities that support us. I know the city's social media can kind of get out of hand a little bit. Um, you mean Facebook? Yes, I would be working with Judy Staley to create some targeted Facebook posts. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how to proceed. I, I, I don't, I'll be honest with you, I'm uncomfortable with giving a carte blanche uh, on this particular item. I mean, if we could um, devise or think of some way this evening to uh, give authorization, but perhaps with the city manager creating some guidelines as to its use. Mayor. Some, can I, Commissioner Eisner? Would we be able to, before you post anything or bring anything up, have our board give a once over before that gets posted to give us some comfort in what they're putting out? I'm, That's not, I, I'm not concerned with the co op's use um, when I'm, as an organization. Just, okay. What I'm concerned about is perhaps some of the members that may be affiliated with a business or somehow kind of taking advantage of that situation. I, I would advise that as, as written, the resolution grants the entity the ability to do so, not its individual members. Uh, if its individual affiliates begin misusing that, we can, the, whoever is your legal counsel, can advise them to cease and desist that activity. And the scope of this, uh, under, the, under the terms of the resolution, is Solar United Neighbors of Florida is authorized to use the Tarpon Springs City Seal unless and until the consent is revoked for outreach and marketing efforts to further solar co-op initiatives. Um, that is the, with reference to the body as a collective, uh, not to its individual members. Okay. So um, I think, it would, just to simplify it, uh, the organization would be able to use the seal, but if anyone discovers that any single member or some commercial entity is using it for their benefit, we can issue a cis and desist order, is that correct? Um, 
I wouldn't necessarily qualify it as an order at the outset. We would certainly, you know, correspondence, cease and desist the activity That's to avoid I mean, any yeah. legal yeah. action. Any individual who does that, um, in spite of that, faces the criminal penalties set forth in that statute, and they do so at their own risk. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Um, um, I'm going to leave it up to the city manager to make sure that there's clarity on that item. Yes, sir. And um, we have a... Um, Let's see where I am right now. We've got the uh, the reading. Uh, we don't have a, a, a second, I'm sorry, a motion or a second at this point. Is that correct? Okay. We've gone to public comments. So may I have a, uh, a, a motion and a I'll second a to, to approve? approve. I'll second. Okay. This is the resolution. Now, are there any conditions that you want to add to that? He made the motion. No? Okay. The only condition, if you would consider uh, the city manager having this kind of, um, I want to call it a discussion, but establishing some guidelines to make sure we're okay with that concerning the seal. Yeah, I would just, that would be an expectation in my book, but if you need a clarification for that, absolutely, I'll Just in case there's any issue later on. Include that. Yeah, yes. okay. I'll second the clarification. All right. Are there any other comments? Roll call, please. Commissioner Cuyas? Yes. Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Ms. Reeves? Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go to um, item 24, which is a um, quasi judicial um, item. And it um, has to do with the um, outdoor plant sales. I'm going to ask Mr. Mora to read the resolution by title, give the instructions for a quasi judicial process, and swear any witnesses in that we may have here for this item. One moment, Mr. Mayor, as I get That's to that fine. item. This is resolution number 2022-28, a resolution of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, approving application number 22-77, requesting conditional use approval to allow for a roadside stand, parentheses, garden center outdoor plant sales, close parentheses, at 18 West Orange Street in the T5D transect zone of the special area plan, providing for findings, providing for conditions, and providing for an effective date. This has been a reading of resolution number 2022-28 by title only. Uh, with that, this is a quasi-judicial proceeding where the Board of Commissioners acts in a quasi-judicial rather than a legislative capacity. At a quasi-judicial hearing, it is not the Board's function to make law, but rather to apply the law that has already been established. In a quasi-judicial hearing, the Board is required by law to make findings of fact based upon the evidence presented at the hearing and apply those findings of fact to previously established criteria contained in this City's Code of Ordinances in order to make a legal decision regarding the application before it. The Board may only consider evidence at this hearing that the law considers competent, substantial, and relevant to the issues. If the competent, substantial, and relevant evidence at the hearing demonstrates the applicant has met the criteria established in the Code of Ordinances, then the Board is required by law to find in favor of the applicant. By the same token, if the competent substantial evidence at the hearing demonstrates that the applicant has failed to meet the criteria established in the code, then the board is required by law to find against the applicant. With that, is there anybody who intends to offer any testimony before this body on this application, on application on, uh, on the resolution at issue? The applicant here. Is there anybody here on behalf of the applicant, the applicant, their agent? Anybody else intending to offer testimony? Ma'am, do, do you swear or affirm the testimony you'll give this body is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do, thank you. Let the record reflect one person has been sworn at this time, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Uh, city Manager is missing, so I'm going to go directly to you, Ms. Mayor, Vincent, if you'd like I, to make your presentation. Mayor? Yes. I just want to disclose I had ex party communications with the applicant today. Okay. Uh, she had talked, I, I went over to her property, just uh, looked at the area she wanted to build the garden area, but she had also disclosed to me about um needing approval from the uh historic preservation board or she thought she needed some approval after a ruling and i, I wasn't sure if i wasn't sure on that outcome and we haven't really ventured with the historic preservation board so remember Kulyas, do you feel that your interactions with this applicant in any way imp um, impairs your ability to impartially adjudicate the matter before you this evening no not at all is that the complete context of your dealings with them yes thank you 
Right. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Is there any other commissioner sat ex party communications? Okay. Mayor, uh, I do you wish to go forward without the applicant here? Pardon me? Yeah. Do you wish to go forward without the applicant? No, the applicant's not here, right? Correct. I, I'm asking if you would, you know, do we if still want we to go forward with, with it? With that? Okay. I, I'm comfortable with okay. what I see, unless a, yeah. another commissioner objects. Uh, this is straightforward. I've been to uh, Ms. Algamides' business a couple of times, so I'm, I, and I know the, uh, the the land that she's talking about utilizing. I do want to ask, though, if there's any affected parties here, anybody that feels that they're an affected party. There's none. Ms. Vincent, if you could proceed with your sure. presentation. Thank you. This is uh, application 22-77. This is a conditional use application for property at 18 West Orange Street. Um, just an area map showing you the, the context. Um, you know, North Pinellas Avenue, Orange Street. This is on the north side. This is on the edge, the very kind of edge of our special area plan in the smart code area. It is in the T5D transect district, which is basically a, a retail mixed-use district. Oops, wrong way. So the applicant is requesting um, a conditional use for the purpose of an outdoor that uh, it's identified in the smart code actually as roadside stand. Um, how that is actually defined as an area or structure used for displaying and selling farm products, including plants, flower seeds, grasses, nursery stock, trees and tree products um, and may operate seasonally or year round. So uh, and that does require conditional use review um, in this particular district. Um, the applicant is proposing to, um, to have three, we're calling them shade structures, 10 by 10 um, in area for the area to display um, the plant sales. Uh, it really is limited to plant sales and very limited accessories. Um, I'll talk about the conditions of approval in a moment. Um, they do intend to expand the existing parking area uh, to accommodate five spaces and an accessible parking space. And then the existing building that's in the rear of the property uh, would be used for for office um, so this is just a graphic depiction of what's what's envisioned so and in, in a pictorial of you know really how they wish to kind of display the plants themselves um, so these you know, kind of like light timber type of construction um, those those actually under our current under the building code now do not even require a permit. Um, with regard to um, the commissioner's discussion uh, about historic preservation, we've really been, this is in the historic district. And so we, and it's just in an abundance of caution, we are asking them to go to the historic preservation board just to get this approved since it's prominently displayed in the front of the lot. So, um, and we'll help them uh, with that process. So again, just kind of the context of the area. Um, this is the um, this is the North Pinellas Avenue uh, Transit District, but it's in the town, the downtown character district. Again, the, so the use it does, as I said, does require the conditional use review. Um, there are no issues with conformance of the uh, with the land development code, and we do uh, think that in the context with the special area plan and the surrounding properties, that it's appropriate uh, and compatible with the area. Um, there are no issues with the comprehensive plan or the special area plan for this particular area and the and the uh, character district that it's in. We do not think that it will adversely impact historical or environmental resources. As we said, we, we will ask them to go to the Historic Preservation Board for those outdoor structures, just to, just to, to button that up and make sure. Um, uh, we don't expect this to adversely affect adjoining property values. Uh, there's really no issues with the city's capacity to provide facilities to this property. And it does provide for efficient orderly de uh, development in that it is really an adaptive reuse of an existing uh, property. So this uh, staff does recommend approval of resolution 2022-28 uh, granting conditional use approval for the operation of a garden center with outdoor plant sales in the T5 district. Staff recommended three conditions. Number one, that merchandise shall be limited to plants and typical garden supplies, excluding bulk storage of mulch, soil, rock, shell, etc., and shall not include yard decor. The applicant must obtain necessary building permits for the change of occupancy type of the existing building and construction of the shade structures. And we did specifically call out the on-site signage required for historic preservation board approval. Uh, we did uh, notice this in accordance with our uh, required notice procedures in the land development code. We've received no public notice or comments on this. 
The Planning and Zoning Board reviewed this on August 22nd. They did recommend approval. They did rework um, the condition number one and recommended that it be reworded to, to read as merchandise shall be limited to plants and yard accessories, such as pots, bird feeders, and wind chimes. Bulk storage of mulch, soil, rock shell, et cetera, and yard art shall not be permitted. And then the other two conditions remained the same. So with that, I'll be happy to um, answer any questions uh, that the board might have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, questions? Um, Vice Mayor Lund. Uh, yeah. Hi, Renee. Hi. Um, it says on-site signage, and on-site signage only requires a Heritage Preservation Board's approval. So when they look at this, are they only going to be looking to, to, to what? So. Uh, all, sign sign all signage in the, in the Historic Preservation District requires um, review and approval by the Historic Preservation Board. So it's really looking at, you know, it, there's, a, there's a reduced size um, allowance for the Historic District, and they're looking at the aesthetics with yeah, the I, area. I, I understand that yeah. part. Is that the only thing the Historic Preservation Board so, is going to be looking at? As, as, I, as I spoke in the in um, earlier, it, we did not put it in as a condition of approval, but we have discussed verbally with the applicant that we are going to ask them to have those shade structures in the front go to the Historic Preservation Board. Can we get that in this in writing? Can, then, yes, please? we can add that as a condition of approval. Yes, sir. Um, the other question I have is is the uh, the original uh, preliminary staff recommendation mm -hmm. uh, basically in, in uh, condition number one said and not shall include yard decor or and shall not include yard decor it's over being dyslexic there for a bit um, and then the PNZ board revised that to adding pots bird feeders and wind chimes um, which I think is out of the nature of this and quite frankly, would prefer prefer to go back to uh, to the preliminary staff recommendation and limit uh, yard decor. So uh, the planning and zoning board had um, quite a bit of discussion with the applicant um, regarding, you know, what we're trying to avoid is like you've seen them. We I have can understand. Yes. yes. So, but she did indicate that you know she would like to be able. I mean, like small wind chimes and things of that nature. So with the back and forth with the Planning and Zoning Board, that, that's the language that the board came up with and recommended. So um, I, it's, you know, I, without the applicant here to kind of provide additional information, I can, I can only kind of reflect what happened at the Planning and Zoning Board from my interpretation. So um, you can certainly, I mean, go back to the original recommendation. That's within your purview. Uh, yeah, I would prefer that, but anyway, that's my only question. Any other questions? Uh, no. Okay. Commissioner Carr. No questions, ma'am. Commissioner Eisner. Commissioner Kulias. I'd like to follow up with uh, Vice Mayor Lunt. I, I think the, tip, the staff recommendations, um, the typical garden supplies, I believe that gives them more leeway to have items there, would it not? Because the PNZ's recommendations are limited to pretty much just those three types of uh, typical guards of garden supplies. So such as that's pretty broad. Well, we can't we can't have discussion. We can only ask questions at this point. Once we close the public hearing, then we can go to commission among uh, discussion among the commissioners and, and get these items resolved. So. Are there any questions? No questions. Okay. Um, the the um, Ms. Vincent, as you said, that there was quite a bit of discussion uh, from the uh, PNZ board as far as resigning, uh, refining the uh, conditions. Uh, was that something in in terms of a question answer um, with the applicant? In other words, it, is it there, was. Yeah. In other words, is there anything else that you might be putting out there that we need to list in here, something along that line, or? I, I don't believe so. I watched the replay yesterday morning, and I mean nothing's really standing out, you know, in, in my mind from 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 watching that replay again. Um, I think they captured what you know what she intends to sell. <laughs> it, she expressed, if I'm interpreting it correctly, that it was really 
really focused on plant sales and that if she wanted to do anything like yard art, she'll put it inside um, in, in the building in the back or in, so that's, you know, so, but something that's like, you know, a small, you know, birdhouses or, you know, a wind chime, something like that that's small um, is, is really what she would seem to be getting at. Is, is there any, um, maybe to help Vice Mayor Lund, I, I, I there, right now, these sort of things, the, um, the spinners, the birdhouses, birdhouses and things like that are not permitted for outside sales at that location. Is that correct? So in that district, so there's an overall, you know, we have a, we have a, a use that says outdoor display of merchandise, and that's not permitted or conditional in this particular district. So the roadside stand and as I said, that, that is a conditional use. It's very narrow. And it says for displaying and selling, um, it says farm products, and then it says including plants, flowers, seeds, grasses, nursery stock, trees, and tree products. So in my mind, actually, that definition really does actually probably take out the yard art and everything else. So um, as, as, as that definition reads, you know, we were trying to put a thumbtack in it and make sure that 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 you know that kind of those large areas of outdoor yard art and decor didn't get included it wasn't it wasn't being extrapolated that that's allowed so um i'm sorry i lost my train of thought of no, what your question it, basically was. what i'm trying to do is there an argument that could uh you know by definition these items would be accessory to the outdoor plants and things like that rather than a uh um, become a primary when they become very popular and the plants are less so must or, be accessory the, uh, the, a way you could get at this is you could put like a percentage of the area limitation so you got three 100 square foot areas and you could say you know no more than 10 percent of the outdoor display area can be dedicated to those wind chimes things like that if you just wanted to really put a box around it and limit it okay all right we'll get to that the rest of that during the discussion um, Okay, that, um, let's go to, uh, we don't have the uh, applicant here, so there's no presentation from the applicant. Um, and then what we're gonna do now is go to the public, um, uh, and let me ask you, would you want your report accepted into evidence? Yes, sir. Okay, let's go to the public. Does the public have any comments concerning this item? Or questions, I should ask. Uh, not com comments at this point, questions. Go ahead, Mr. Geddes. Hi, uh, again, thank you. Uh, David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live at 802 Georgia Avenue in Palm S Harbor. Sir, before you begin, may you raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm any testimony you give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Are there, my question would be, are there any limitations as to what type of plants that they can sell, um, such as uh, fruit trees of such? avocado, mulberry, orange trees, pecan trees. There's a number of uh, fruit trees which, oddly enough, it seems as though, for example, the city arborist for Dunedin, Art Finn, retired from the city of Dunedin, then went to work for the city of Safety Harbor. I don't recall that man planting a single fruit tree in his entire professional career working for the government. In light of the fact that this county was based on agriculture, oranges and such. Um, I do find it uh, egregious right. that there has been no promotion in that regard of uh, um, fruit trees. And my question would be, uh, yeah. is there any stipulation as to not permitting them to sell fruit trees? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gettys. So the question is, would this application prevent the sale of, of trees, of uh, fruit trees? Is yes. that what your question was? Yes, Mayor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Geddes. In all fairness, sir, um, if you could just raise your right hand, uh, your other right hand. Do you swear from right. the testimony you're going to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing, nothing but, the, but truth? the truth? Is that a yes, sir? I say yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, due to, in, in fairness to the applicant, is it possible that we can request to ask them and then come back and revisit? Because it seemed like we might be in a box here to, we want to lean one way, we don't know which way to lean, we want to be fair, and we don't want to limit somebody else that may follow behind. 
I'm kind of in a toss up of clarification to make sure if somebody else wants to move forward that we don't be in a box or step outside the box the wrong way. I kind of think the mayor was struggling with the same type of thing. So to the fairness, is there any way we can get the applicant so we'll have a clearness of it? Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Are there any other public with questions? Anita Pros, 901 Bayshore Drive. Two things used you to be. I'm sorry, ma'am, I don't oh, mean to interrupt yes. you. Do you swear from the testimony you'll give it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. I'm I appreciate sorry, it. I didn't Thank do you. It earlier. I was eating my turkey sandwich. Uh, uh, it used was it to good? Be, You're on record. <laughs> I know. No, I was saying, was the turkey sandwich good? You're on record. Yes, it was. Okay, great. <laughs> came from Publix, Boar's Head. Um, uh, it used to be if the applicant wasn't here, we didn't hear the issue. That's changed. Could you speak up a little louder? That if the applicant wasn't here, we didn't hear the issue. Has that changed? We, it, we proceed at, at her risk, and I, I'm assuming that um, you had called and contacted her and she was aware of that? Uh, that and, she was and, told and that the Moore, meeting was this evening, yes. I'm not exactly sure, especially in light of the commissioner speaking with her today, so I'm not sure what happened I, there. Okay. Mr. Moore, do you, uh, do you have any comment on that? I've reviewed your rules of procedure adopted in 2022 as it relates to quasi-judicial proceedings. There's nothing in there specifically stating that a hearing can or cannot proceed. Um, the record thus far indicates that notice was provided of this hearing. And uh, on that point, the applicant chooses to participate yeah. or not at their own discretion. Okay, that answers that. And the second thing is on fruit trees, I'm not an arborist, but the greening effect with the little beetle, and they've pulled up all the trees. I know on Bayshore, we had to pull up all our fruit trees. And the University of Florida is working on a solution. And I don't know if you can sell fruit trees. It was brought up here, and that's something we need to look into. Uh, there's been um, uh, that you couldn't buy fruit trees, and you couldn't sell fruit trees. And in the uh, belt through the state, where uh, was the fruit belt, they had to abide by that. So I don't know if that's something we need to consider or not. Thank you. And the gentleman has asked, that the applicant, applicant be here because they do have a problem and they need to get it solved. Okay. Mayor. Um, hang on a second. Um, was that Commissioner Cuyas? Yes. Did, uh, you, we, we don't, we're at the public right now. We're gonna have to wait. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other public comments? IT or is there any other, uh, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand. You'll be allowed in to talk. We do not have any raised hands at this time, sir. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing, and um, let's go to commission comments. Um, Vice Mayor Lunt, um, Ms. Vincent, um, represented that on those wind chimes and little accessory items that we could impose a, a, a square foot or a percentage limit as far as the outdoor area that she could utilize for these sort of things. I don't know whether that helps, but do you have any further thoughts on that? Uh, that doesn't help me at all. Okay. I just, I can see what it was going to die for. I have a concept of what it might devolve into. Um, I also believe where it says that the merchandise shall be limited to plants, we need to specify house plants or the size of plants. We don't want her selling trees. We don't want her to turn into a, a Home Depot selling, you know, uh, Robolini palms in the front sort of thing. I understand that's not her intention, but the trouble is once we put this into a resolution and the resolution's there, it's the law, she can do whatever she wants that's within that aspect, and that's what I'm concerned about. Yeah. I don't think this is stringent enough any way through, and as it's written, <coughs> I don't feel like I would approve it. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Carr. 
Thanks, Mayor. Um, I think this one's pretty simple. Uh, if we go off of what the applicant actually says in the backup, since I closed the garden and the relic on Pinellas Avenue, my customers in the hundreds have asked daily for me to open up a garden center. This one will be plant-based only. I ask that this idea be seriously considered. So it looks like the applicant in the backup is requesting a plant-based only. Plants, not trees. Plants, I think trees fall in the same category, but you've got plants that are flowers, trees, bushes. Uh, I've got no issues if they want to put a couple trees in the back or somewhere in, the, in there too. So um, what I'm saying is I don't, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of accessories. She's just saying plants only. And that's what I'm talking about. And so that's what she's asking for is to be plants only. Plants only. And that's the slide that was provided by No, no, I, yeah. I understand. I just want to make sure. I just want to point it emphasis. out. Okay. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would agree with the uh, plant base, you know, because that's what it says here. Um, and it also says excluding bulk storage of mulch, soil, rock shell. So I don't think they're looking to become the uh, new Home Depot on Orange. So as long as we f accept and put in the resolution exactly what she's requesting, um, I don't really care if they want to do 10% uh, wind chimes or not. It's not going to change my life. I don't think it's going to change the life of people in Tarpid Springs. Um, so on that, I really don't, I don't have a iron in the fire. Um, and that's pretty much it. I, as long as we keep this, it, it seems like it's a almost a temporary structure. And I'm hoping for her sake that if we have a good gust of wind, it doesn't take down what they're looking to put up. That's what I'm more concerned with. I, so. I think they're going to have to um, abide by the Florida Building Code. Right. And, and I know. there's a wind speed requirement on those, too. So anything else, sir? That's pretty much it. Commissioner Kulias, I you can ask or comment or whatever you'd like it to No, support. I think a lot of those answers, uh, those questions were answered. Uh, listen, I think this is a good project. It, it brings a lot of green uh, uh, green space to the area, especially when you're driving east or west on Orange Street. Uh, th that business has a lot of foot traffic. It's actually good for the downtown area. Um, I think looking back at that planning and zoning meeting, they they did a good job screening on what was going to be sold at the property and so i'd like to push forward and approve it thank you mayor okay um i've been to the business a couple of times um and um uh, i won't say i personally know ms Gamidas. i know who she is and um it, it's a pretty nice business uh that she's operating so far and, and um i think anytime we could add greenery to an area that's positive for me and um, of course that's going to depend on on maintaining those plants until they're sold and things but that's always a challenge here and and i'm you know quite frankly i i, I think some months are going to go well other months aren't going to be so well so um, this is a conditional use and um, if if there if there's something that uh, becomes an issue i would suspect we could probably discuss that with the um, business owner and, and uh, see if there's something that could be done with that. Um, as far as the, um, the um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there were a couple of ornamental um, bird houses already hanging in there in the yard uh, in approaching to the business. I don't know that they were for sale. They were mostly decoration. Um, so they weren't that, they weren't objectionable to me at all. Um, I, I really, as far as I'm concerned, I'm open. I, I think it's, um, I, I think that um, Ms. Alamogadius, uh, the Bohemian Gypsy, is looking to offer another um, um, kind of a, a service to residents as far as plants go, and, and I think that's fine. And usually, um, I've always felt that um, a rule of thumb that when you approve a business, it's really up to the residents as far as whether they're going to keep it in business. If it's if it's determined that it's not a need, it's not going to stay in business. So sometimes um, things get resolved that way, one way or the other. Other times, if they're if they're extremely successful, then we really made a good decision. Um, so that's all the questions I have uh, or comments that I have on this. Now um, we're at the point where we're going to be making a um, uh, a motion 
uh, to um, uh, approve and a second, but I would ask that um, there may be a little bit of a difference of opinion on some of the commissioners. Uh, if, if one commissioner can go ahead and, and craft that recommendation and put in there those things that, um, that they're willing to support, and um, for example, whether it's um, the staff recommendations or the PNZ recommendations or some modification of the PNZ recommendations, if we want to restrict the um, area as far as the um, uh, display uh, to 10% or some other percentage. And then also there is that condition that Ms. Vincent, uh, I believe, uh, was offering to have it go to the Historic Preservation Board for those items yes. that are deemed necessary. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. I, I've kind of described sort of the content of the recommendation or the motion. Now I'm going to need somebody to make that motion. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2022-28 uh, in addition to the recommendations by the Planning and Zoning Board and a condition to have this application reviewed by the Historic Preservation Board. Okay. Is that clear to everybody or is there a second? I need a clarification real quick. So you, you're going off of what the Planning and Zoning Board recommended for conditions, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Is I'll, there a second? A second. Okay. Is there any further discussion on that item? I'm not going to support it. Right. Not if none, let's have roll call, please. Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? No. Mayor Batikiedis? Yes. Okay. All your vote of 4 1, this stands approved, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Ms. Moore. That. Um, ends the ordinances or resolutions. We're going to go back to the um, special consent um, agenda. And um, the very first item, I should ask, does any commissioner need to take a break? I do. You do? Okay. Yeah. Um, let's take a 10-minute break and reconvene at um, 836.
involved. Pleasure to meet you, sir. Have a good evening. We're all seated. Ms. Jacobs, you ready? We're reconvening the meeting at 8.37 p.m. Um, we'll proceed with um, the special consent agenda, item 15, adoption of the uh, strategic plan. Mr. LaCourse, I'm going to go ahead and go to Ms. Vincent. Yes, go ahead. And Ms. Vincent, I know we've, um, we've got Ms. Henning here and, and Ms. Christ is not here, so I know you want to do some introductions. Yes. Ready? Proceed, so, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, so um, for the board's consideration, uh, we have the City of Tarpon Springs Strategic Plan Community Report. Uh, just a real kind of a quick overview. Um, we really kicked this process off in earnest in June of 2021. Uh, we, uh, with the um, consultants, uh, University, of South, uh, University, of, University of South Florida Institute of Government and the collaborative labs at St. Pete College. <coughs> and it was really an 18 month process to develop a strategic plan for the city. Uh, phases one and two are complete, and that really is culminating in this uh, this report that you have before you this evening. Um, upon acceptance of the report, we'll move into the implementation phase, um, which is really where, you know, where the rubber meets the road, I suppose. Um, so this, the recommendation is to accept the, the report, allowing for minor future adjustments and for any grammatical and Scribner's errors. And uh, with us here to answer any questions from the board uh, is uh, Andrea Henning with St. Pete College Collaborative Labs and Rob Robin Odegaard with um, Angela Christ's um, uh, colleague with the University of South Florida Institute of Government. So I'll step aside and turn it over to you and them. Well, let me just say, um, if you'd like to come forward, I, I, we're not gonna have a presentation then, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, let me just say something that um, we started this um, in, in 2021 formally by bringing the Institute of Government and the St. Petersburg College Cooperative Labs on board. Um, the idea, uh, the nucleus, at least the embryonic idea of the uh, uh, strategic plan was about a year before that, but it took us a little bit to get started. And then um, we proceeded very quickly um, and I believe that there was very strong community engagement. We identified stakeholders, um, businesses, residents, leadership teams here at the city, city employees in general were, were surveyed and um, that culminated in what we have today is the uh, strategic plan. And um, I have an introductory message in there that I, I wish I had it in front of me because that kind of summarizes everything. But um, Ms. Henning, I'm gonna ask you if you could go ahead and, and summarize basically what the plan is um, um, what's in it, and, and then we'll go from there. Thank you, Mayor, and it's great to be with you, Board of Commissioners. It has been a fruitful journey the last 13 months, and you have before you the plan. Uh, hopefully, tonight will be adopted. Uh, it, as, as you mentioned, it has been through many phases. We've cast a broad net from the community involvement, key stakeholders, employees, uh, lots of community and citizen engagements, many board uh, workshops, many staff workshops, and each of the phases informed the next. And so what you have are the vision, the mission, the goals. Uh, we have guiding principles and values before us. And it's very meaningful because this has been a great body of work that we've all contributed to. and. Uh, I feel you should be very proud of what we've been able to come forward with. We were able to um, you know, establish six strategic themes, infrastructure, community engagement, quality of life, smart growth and redevelopment, culture, heritage and preservation, and good governance. And within those six strategic themes, and these all came forward from, uh, from everyone's voice. We have goals that you all uh, prioritized last time we were together. We have objectives that were carefully crafted and are living. I mean, we're, we're going to continue to refine them as we move along. And we started to build the, uh, the strategic tactical plan with the staff. And so you can see that we've made a lot of progress. Um, 
And so what we're here to do this evening is in addition to adopting the plan, look toward the next phase, which is, you know, I, I feel the implementation phase is where the rubber meets the road. It's where all strategic plans rise and fall. And it is um, really the most important piece because now you put in motion what you have said you were going to do. And as we look at the next, you know, eight months together on this journey, um, I would in encourage us to, to really bake this strategic plan into the DNA of everyday life for the staff, for the Board of Commissioners. Please don't put it on a, on a shelf and let it collect us. Let's, let's make this part of our roadmap, our playbook, uh, and that's what we're going to embark upon with the staff in November, starting in November with our first quarterly workshop. Uh, and then what we would do is have opportunities to engage with the board, keep you apprised of the progress we're making. Uh, we're going to build a, a dashboard so that it's a living, uh, breathing plan, and we'll reevaluate and recalibrate each quarter with the staff. Um, we'll hold them accountable, we'll hold you accountable as a Board of Commissioners. We'll engage with the community, we'll have opportunities for workshops in the coming months to give progress reports and ongoing engagement. So this is kind of the continuation of the final leg of this journey, phase three. Thank you, Ms. Henning. Mm -hmm. uh, let me go to uh, public comments, if there's any public comments. Um, the uh, strategic plan is available online. Also, some backup information, I think, with Connect Tarpon Springs. Is that correct, Ms. Vincent? Okay, yeah. so if you want to go online and see the whole process of how it evolved and also the plan itself, the, implement, the plan is the plan, but the implementation is really where you get the value out of the plan. Yes. Also, it, it is a, uh, a first cut at the plan. As time goes on, um, it will evolve, uh, refine, and focus in a little more on, on what the residents um, are hoping for the community in the future. Mm -hmm. So um, let me go to uh, public comments, if there's any public comments on that. Um, Tina Bukovalis, 115 Athens Street, and my apologies, but I'm recovering from bronchitis, so my voice comes and goes. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you overall on the strategic plan. I think, I think it's an excellent start, and I was there at the workshops, and I, I know you were listening. I do have one problem with, uh, with one element of it that I do want to bring up because I do think it's important. Um, uh, in um, the theme C, uh, which has to do with cultural resources, um, goal C1 protect, is protect the city's unique cultural heritage resources and identity. And um, let me clarify that I am a folklorist and cultural anthropologist. I've been professionally involved with documenting uh, uh, culture in the state and working with communities from Miami to Tallahassee and all around the state for 35 years or more. And so I have a great deal of expertise in this area, um, just as background. But <clears throat> I have no problem with this goal, but I, th um, and I remember when this came up at the meeting and I wanted, um, I felt objective one was very problematic, but there was no mechanism at that time for me to state that. Um, it was just put out there. So objective C11 is market and promote cultural heritage resources and identity. The first goal is to market and promote cultural heritage resources and identity. And this makes no sense to me. Um, if our goal is to protect, how, who are we, we're marketing, I'm assuming, to tourists. How is this about protecting and supporting our cultural identity? We, we should not take as our first goal to monetize it, but to protect it and support it. This was exactly the problem that we had in 2014 with the sponge docks proposed renovations, where the whole goal well, it was entirely oriented towards tourists and not supporting the community itself. 
For many years, the city's dominant municipal paradigms have centered around development oriented towards tourism and commercial interests rather than community interests. But the people who shape our communities uh, from the ground up should have the primary agency. We need to preserve not just our building facades, but the authentic cultural context and not just try to monetize it. What's most crucial in this process is working closely with the communities to achieve their aspirations and find out the best ways to preserve their traditions. Tourism to Tarpon Springs is largely cultural tourism, and people aren't stupid. The more authentic things are, the more the tourists will come. Um, but we have to but we have to take care to build from that point and not start from the point of simply trying to monetize our culture. I don't have any problem with objective number two. Objective um, C13, I think there also needs to be some discussion about, uh, which is to, uh, and you're quite right, seek grant opportunities <coughs> to preserve cultural and heritage. Absolutely, yes. But who's going to do this? Um, I want to point out that this is exactly what I did during the 10 years when I was the um, Curator of Arts and Historical Resources and brought in about $350,000 for cultural programming here um, and created events like Night in the Islands, about a dozen exhibits, also festivals, lectures, music and food workshops, concert series, and not just involving Greek culture, but also African American and, and other culture in the city, Latin American culture. Unfortunately, after I decided to leave my position, is that the buzzer for me? All right, um, Annie Samarcos, okay. Um, uh, the city decided to reorganize and remove that position and inse instead have an assistant director position. So there currently is no one on the city staff whose background is in, um, in preserving culture and history and heritage. And I would strongly suggest that the city might come back around to consider uh, um, changing those positions back to um, the, their original format so there can be someone who can do more of the historical and cultural kinds of uh, programming and grant writing for the city. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Are there any other, um, we'll, we'll address some of these things when we get to the commission comments. Are there any other public comments? IT, are there any um, remote <coughs> access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have to raise hands at this time. Thank you. Um, let's go to uh, commission comments. Uh, Vice Mayor Lunt. You know, um, I participated in this as a, as a resident, as I was running for office, and also as an official after I was elected. I've seen the work that went into this plan. It's something that we've needed in this city for a substantial amount of time. Um, I think we put a lot of effort into it. I do not think it's perfect. It's a working plan, as plan should be, and I look forward to the workshops, and I wanted to thank you very much for your participation. So that's all. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Commissioner Carr. Yeah, we had the opportunity to meet for many hours, over many days, uh, over many months. And this is where we're at. And I appreciate all the work that everyone put in from staff to consultants to um, two different commission, board of commissions, um, to where we're at today. So I, I do think we've got a good document. And I uh, appreciate your hard work behind that. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with my prior commissioner's comments. I enjoyed it. I was there also as a candidate and as a commissioner. Um, one of the big takeout takeaways that I got from it was um, hearing the residents and actually most of the staff wanting smart development and not just development in any open space that we have here in Tarpon Springs and let's build something gargantuous. You know, so I, I really enjoyed hearing the feedback 
um, because we really didn't have that in the past and it was more of a mishmash in my opinion. So it was clearly uh, stated that we would um, look to have, you know, smaller um, areas, two family areas. Um, I mean, listening to what uh, Tina was saying also about having um, some goals set. I mean, all, overall, it was just very impressive for me. Um, I, I really feel like we got um, an idea or something. It's like um, Vice Mayor said, it's not perfect. It's, it's, it's a wheel in motion, but it's a starting point. And if you don't have a starting point, anybody can just come up with anything and it's, uh, it, that's how it runs. So you can't run a city like that. So I do want to thank you. It was a lot of hard work by the staff, by the residents, by everybody. So I do want to thank everybody. It was really well done and I appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Kulias. Yeah, it, it was great to be able to uh, view it all as a, as a resident and then also participate as a, as a commissioner. We had some, uh, like Commissioner Eisner said, we had some fun engaging activities over <laughs> at the SBC and here. And it's all about getting a direction, you know, whether it be five, ten years, just having those basic building blocks for a foundation for us and future boards to go off of. and. This won't sit on the shelf, not with this board. And uh, I'm sure the residents will be able to remind this board and current boards, hey, uh, you guys got a strategic plan, follow it. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the, um, we had a strategic plan actually that was created in 1993 and, and kind of went by the wayside um, in the early 2000s. So I appreciate your comment about not putting it on the shelf and also just simply letting it die. Um, you'll see an, an agenda item a little later about um, some of the proposed uh, charter amendments, which has something to do with this strategic plan about memorializing in the charter. So we'll kind of move forward with that. Um, the one value of the strategic plan was um, it brought residents out to tell the commission, to tell the city and the staff what they want for a city. Up until this point, we, you know, residents, um, you'd hear from some former commissioners <coughs> that, you know, we, we really don't, uh, we have an issue with, with getting information. It's just, it's even hard enough to get people to come to commission meetings. Well, we've got people here now. And I think this plan has gone a long way to um, engage the community in, in communicating with the city government as far as what they're looking for. And I, I really, truly believe that the uh, city staff has appreciated the information that's come forward as well. So I'm, I'm hoping this will be guidance for future commissions as well. Um, it, and then the other thing, of course, was the, um, uh, it, it, it basically identifies priorities, but you, we really need to be careful. When you list five items in the strategic plan, you can easily get wrapped around trying to discuss which item is more important than the other. But the fact is that there's five items. There's a whole lot that aren't even in the plan. And so what those five items are, are a priority. And I've wrestled with this as far as the, um, the, the, um, the, the um, I, I guess the list, as far as which should come first and which should come second. But then when I got to looking at it, I says, well, you know, they're all important. And, but there's a lot of things that are not in there, like um, uh, huge projects, for example, uh, uh, development, increasing density, a number of things that we've heard in the past that um, I, I know that the residents did not want. Um, the other item is that then when this project initiated, the strategic planning process started, there were a lot of other pro processes that were beginning within the city as well. One of them was the update on the comprehensive plan. We also talked about the uh, sustainability uh, action plan that was started at the same time. In addition, uh, Dr. Bukovalis uh, initiated the Greektown uh, Historic uh, Preservation Association and, and uh, promoting creating a character district in that location along in, uh, of course, our planning staff initiated the Union Academy Character District, <coughs> District and we're working towards a community rating agency for that area as well. These things did not exist when the strategic plan started. So its implementation is gonna be very, very important. Um, 
it's going to draw out some shortcomings of the plan. There's no doubt in my mind. And we're just going to have to list what those are and pick them up on the next review. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate Dr. Bukovalis's, and I'm, I'm hoping you'll be a part of the implementation um, as well as continuing on with what we've got um, looking forward to with the Greek Town uh, Character District, which at some point, um, all of these things are going to get folded into the comp plan. We'll have the strategic plan. We have the sustainability, and then not just the implementation of the strategic plan, but everything has to be integrated. Yes. They all have to work together, and that's the key. Um, don't ask me how that's going to happen. We're going to figure it out as we go along, and that's going to need the help of everybody involved. So I, I'm not too concerned about, um, uh, you know, out of five items, which is coming first, which is coming second. There may be something that's missing that's important that we need to um, identify and, and make a list on it and bring it up later. And also, when we do our implementation, we're going to wind up making a list on what adjustments have to be made during the, um, the next round on this thing with updating this strategic plan. Um, that's all I've got to say. And um, uh, does commissioners have any other qu uh, comments or questions? I, lastly, I do want to thank the um, um, USF Institute of Government and the St. Petersburg uh, Collaborative Labs. I know we started out with the Institute of Government, and then um, there was kind of like a, whoa, <laughs> maybe we should get SPC Collaborative Labs on board as well. And as I understand, the implementation is going to be mostly on the shoulders of St. Petersburg College. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, thank you very much for everything. I mean, it's just a, a simple thank you from us this evening. and and. Um, it, it should be a very, very huge thank you to get to have gotten us here with not just, you know, Tarpon Springs is not an easy town to work with them. <laughs> I mean, you've got some distinct personalities here. You've got some personalities that were on the former board. Um, you've got a whole lot of people out there that, that, um, that they all know what's important for Tarpon Springs. Thank goodness y'all were able to pull out some common things, uh, values, goals, um, the core values of what we believe in to, to actually document them in the plan. So thank you for that. You. Um, what I'd like to do at this point is have a motion to approve the um, strategic plan with a second. Motion to approve the adoption of the strategic plan. Second. Second. For our second. Okay, second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kouyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Henning. Thank you. Thank you. So, Mayor, what did you mean by unique personalities there? <laughs> uh, okay, now we're going to go to the one that I thought we were going to be doing earlier. Uh, item 16, Select Advanced Roofing DBA Advanced Green Technologies. Uh, for RFQ number 220082-S-JL, solar power for the osmosis water facility. Now, I'll turn over to you, Paul, to introduce. Good evening, Paul Smith, Public Services Director. With me also is Thomas Kiger, Acting Public Services Assistant Director. I just want to introduce the item and ask uh, Thomas to uh, take over for me on this. He's put a lot of work into it along with other city staff. But I think this is a big opportunity for the city. I want to say it's uh, consistent with our strategic plan, part of our infrastructure for adding renewable energy. It's a substantial project we facing uh, tripling the capacity of renewable energy at the RO facility. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Kiger. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas Kiger, Assistant Public Services Director. Uh, today we're asking for y'all's, for the uh, board's approval to um, proceed with this project it is phase two of the solar energy project for the reverse osmosis water treatment facility. Um, this was competitively bid. Uh, we would look to award to the, um, to the winning bidder. And this project, again, as Paul said, will triple the amount of solar energy production. And one thing we also wanted to point out today is that uh, this is perhaps a down payment on implementing one of the goals within the strategic plan. Goal 1A calls for a citywide green energy program. Uh, we view this as the next logical step uh, towards our existing solar program at, uh, within the water and wastewater utilities. It will further our operational efficiency, result in monetary savings, and improve the overall sustainability of utility operations. And with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you. Um, 
Let me go to public comments. Are there any public comments concerning the new solar panels that we're adding to the uh, reverse osmosis plant, our water plant? The water plant produces 100% of our water and we're at about 50% capacity, so it's a very important facility for our city. Any public comments? IT, are there any um, remote access comments? Line would like to speak on this item. Please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Thank you. Uh, Com Vice Mayor Lund. Let's uh, go to the commissioners now. Vice Mayor Lund. Um, yeah, I'm pretty familiar with it. I don't really have too many questions. Is there an anticipated phase three or is this, is this it? Uh, there is additional room for uh, future phase three that would be quite a bit smaller is my understanding than the, the uh, current phase that we're entertaining today. Uh -huh. Are we ever going to reach a point where we're, we're neutral as far as power consumption by the RO facility and this plant? Based on the existing footprint, um, you know, of what's available on site for additional solar capacity, uh, this would not get us to, uh, we don't have room on site. Uh, long term, this is something we've talked about with uh, Robin, our sustainability coordinator, and uh, that would require, you know, to get to 100%, we would just need a little bit more surface area. Um, and so uh, we'd probably be looking at like off site energy or something like that. All right, thank you. No more questions. Thank you. Commissioner Carr. Yeah, thanks. Uh, love this. Uh, I think it's great. Um, make your own, the city's making their own water. Now they're going to make their own power to make their own water. Um, question for you. To piggyback off the vice mayor, what is the, I mean, what does this take us to capacity? Are you aware of that? Or is that something I need to connect with the offline? Uh, based on our overall energy consumption with the RO facility uh, on an annual basis, uh, this would take us, currently we're at about 5%, 4 to 5% uh, power generation. Uh, this would take us up to around 15%, although it's important to note that during the day when these are operate, the panels will be producing power. Uh, currently, we can go up to about 25% energy pr uh, demand during the day, um, and so this would uh, triple that, so we could you know, get well over half of our daytime uh, energy uh, demands met by solar. Okay, that's great. And this is all just, it's not on any structures like buildings, this is all just on open land, right? Uh, yes, this will be ground mounted. We're going to utilize uh, existing space uh, in the stormwater ponds uh, primarily. Uh, they're already impervious uh, for permitting purposes, so putting some solar panels on top of them and maintaining all the storage is a good way to add panels without the need to add additional stormwater infrastructure, sure. uh, but they'll all be ground mounted. Yeah, great. I appreciate you guys working on this. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Tommy. Okay, Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Do you know what we spend now? Just the ballpark on electricity? Uh, at the reverse osmosis facility? Yes. Uh, we're usually in the neighborhood of about $700,000 annually. Wow. Wow. I'm not trading bills with you. Um, so I have question two is you have an evaluation score and they have uh, advanced roofing is 102. What is the score ratio? What are we actually is 120? the top, what, how do we do, how do we evaluate this? Uh, that's um, a good question. Uh, this was uh, a unique process where we first pre-qualified all of the, uh, the applicants, um, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the bidders. So there was an initial score and then afterwards they were asked to cut the pre-qualified um, bidders were asked to submit bids. Uh, the scoring system um, was set up uh, in cooperation with procurement. I'm not, I don't have that in front of me for the, the total cost. Uh, but we do have Janina here available yes, to talk I, I about saw the bidding her. process. I, I saw her sneaking out the back there. Hello. <laughs> I knew the question was for you. Yes, okay. thank you. Janina Lewis, Procurement Services Director. So the way we did it was we did the qualification scoring and the total points value was 115 points because we did it as a two-step bidding process. So first we did the evaluation factors for the qualifications and the experience and then that added up to, you could get a potential 100 points. Then when the pricing came in, the total points you could get for that was 15 points. That's why they scored 102. Gotcha, thank you. I would love if you could send me that criteria. Certainly. Um, because that's something that interests me on how that bid gets done. So thank Certainly. you. Certainly, we do that for a lot of the proposals. Um, so my other last and final question, Burke Construction, 
What is they did not bid at ad alts? What does that mean? I'm sorry. So uh, when we sent out the request for the pricing proposal, there was a total base bid, and then there were additional ad additive alternatives that they could bid on. There was, I believe, three, um, and those were optional to bid. Uh, so the company that chose not to bid on the ad alts only provided a base price. So how would you be able then to make that comparison? We only did the comparison based off of the preference of the total base bid. So they were awarded the total 15 points because they did come in at the lowest base bid. Um, then if you look at the other two companies based off of their scoring, they were then, comp it's a compilation of a formula we use for the points. So then each one, basically it would be the next low and then the, the next high and then the final, whoever came in highest. But because they chose not to bid on the ad alts, uh, we did not recommend them as the potential because the city is choosing to go with the adults for the best value. I need you to try to help me with these adults. I just don't understand. I don't mean to. Um, because they're rated fairly high. You have a 91 uh, evaluation score. So I still, th their uh, price was less um, than half. So were they bidding on part of the deal? I, I just don't understand that. That's where I'm losing you a little bit. Uh, let me see if I can explain. So basically, um, ad alts are, if we have the budget to obtain those, then we try to get those. So we put them in a priority order. What so is we have those? A we have a total base budget for the project, and that's what everyone is bidding on. And then the ad alternates are kind of, you would consider them kind of like a, a nice to have if we have the budget to obtain these. But in the case of this actual RFP, normally the highest rated proposal is the selected vendor that we would go with. So even though they rated high, they didn't rate the highest. Yes, I, I understand that. It's just, it's just hard for me to understand what they're, what they're actually bidding at. Um, are you saying that they bid at part of the of, of the wish list? Yes, they only bid the total base bid. I, I sent them a clarification and I um, ensured that they understood the process and they said yes, they chose to only do the total base bid. Very strange, that's all I can tell you. Okay, at least I understand. I, I thank you for your hard work. It okay. doesn't make sense to me, but it doesn't have to. Well, I think it would be good to get with Ms. Lewis sometimes and have her explain it in more detail. I think it's important. I, yeah. I know Ms. Lewis is very experienced in the federal government, and you know it, it's it's. No, I don't, don't want to use the word complicated, yeah. but it it is convoluted anyway. So, yeah. yeah. I thank you. I I, I, I will send you the follow-up information. I wasn't questioning you I was kind of questioning the the bidder yeah, yeah I know I that, mean, that's what I'm getting at and okay. not not yeah. questioning Ms. Lewis it just doesn't make sense why why would you bid on part of the project and know that you you're not going to get it and then you send in a request saying if you don't bid on this entire thing you're out and they go yeah we know that so why did they waste any time in the first place then this just makes any common sense to me I, I can't respond for the I the know I know so. Well, that's why I had to ask the question because it just, if something doesn't make sense, I'm going to ask it. So, certainly, certainly. Thank you. Anything else, Commissioner? No, I'm Commissioner. good. Commissioner Kuyas. Yeah, I only have uh, the installation, just the locations. I remember going to the RO plant, there, uh, the solar panels are on the, the north side, and uh, I'm just concerned about the western portion. Is that going to be uh, that drainage area right, right off of LNR Industrial Boulevard, right in the front? And there was enough space over there? Yeah, there, uh, there are uh, four different areas that will be getting solar panels. They'll primarily be going over the existing stormwater retention ponds. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I, these are, these uh, panels uh, are, uh, I want to say, I don't want to say identical, but basically the same material, the same type of solar panel as the ones we've already purchased. Is that correct? 
Yes, that's one uh, reason we were very pleased with this contractor. They were also the contractor for phase one. So all the materials, the solar panels, the transformer equipment, and the inverters will all be uh, compatible and uh, same as the exact same as in phase one. And, and I, I do know, I think I've asked this before in the first round of these things are, um, I, I know there's, um, I think maybe two types of solar panels. One degrades faster than the other. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, we got the better quality solar panel uh, rather than the other type of material? Um, uh, I can't speak to the exact uh, materials, but I can say that these do have a 30-year warranty, and they have a warranty that specifically addresses uh, degradation over time. So these are warranted for 30 years, and they're guaranteed to maintain 85% of their nominal capacity. 85%? Over, over 30 years, yes, sir. Okay. Is that what you all base the numbers on, the return on investment? Do you know? or Yes. Okay. That's good. That's all I had. I, I, um, I, I'm familiar with the bidding process, and, and um, I know each one is, is um, different, and um, I think that um, each vendor is given an opportunity to bid on the whole package. And I think the question of why they didn't bid on the whole package would be better for the vendor to answer. And um, I think sometimes, um, Maybe that's the area that they're comfortable with. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. So I understand learning. what you're saying. I'm learning. Yeah, we all we all learn every time uh, something like this comes up. So, uh, Commissioner Carr, I see that you have your light on. Do you have another comment? Yeah, I just had a follow-up question from Commissioner Eisner, and I mean some of the same thought processes that I had. So when you and I understand the adults. I mean these are you could pick and choose. You want to do adult one, two, but you don't want to do three and four, or vice versa. Um, but why not if is it more like we didn't know what the or the city wasn't anticipating like what the bids could come in at because of inflationary issues or other things going on to not put it all in one package or is it can you give me a little more understanding of why you actually put the adults in there for that, this project uh, for this it's fairly typical for us when we're doing these larger construction projects especially when there's a lot of uncertainty in construction pricing nowadays to uh, break the project into discrete adults that way when you bid the project if the costs come in much higher than anticipated or much higher than you budgeted, you can still proceed with a smaller uh, scale of the project. So we basically divide it up into s several discrete geographic segments and uh, with the, the core area and then the additional panels uh, to increase the solar capacity. So if you did like all four of them together and the prices came out at like 2.7 million, you're like, well, it's way above what we're doing. We have to reject everything and start over then? Basically, yes, that's that the point. case. If, if okay. you you know, if you uh, bid the overall project as one base bid and the, the costs come in extremely high, um, you know, you would have to rebid the project or change the basis of how the project was bid if, if you don't have the, the money to build the project. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. I have a question off of that last question. So do we have any numbers to know what the advanced roofing came in versus Burke Construction on what at least Burke Construction bid on. Yeah. Yes. Um, page three. Yeah. The numbers are here. I can't read that. It is in the backup documentation for the base bid. The <coughs> Burke Construction bid uh, 557000 and some change. And... Um, Advanced roofing bid uh, seven fifty four thousand and uh, some change, uh, and uh, Matcon Construction bid uh, one point four million dollars. Wow. Okay. So it was about a quarter of a million more on the at least on what Burke did. Not for Burke, but for on that on the first part of it. The base bid was about yeah a little less than two hundred thousand dollars more than the base bid for the other contractor. But they did not bid on the adults, nor did they, uh, nor, the, nor did the uh, the low bidder achieve the high score in the overall ranking process. Okay. Doesn't again, it doesn't make sense, but it, again, it doesn't have to. So, I'm okay with that. Doesn't make sense for the contract. That's what I, I'm just. No, saying. no, I understand. You you asked something interesting that I think maybe should be clarified and and and. Um, uh, is there any logic to um, with having such a discrepancy between the uh, lowest base and, and advanced 
um, of 200,000 just simply to accept the base and then rebid the other adults in a separate RFP at a later time? That's exactly what I was thinking. I think there's a good reason to proceed right now. We're obviously in an inflationary environment. Uh, the longer you wait, the, you know, we've often, we've had some cases where we've rebid projects and they've come back more expensive in the future. So you always work, operate at risk when you go to rebid something. Um, the other thing is that based on uh, the winning uh, bidder's uh, proposal, the added, the additive alternatives are actually some of the most cost effective, effective portions of the project. So including the adults from this contractor actually uh, greatly improves the cost effectiveness of the overall project uh, on a like dollars per kilowatt of capacity basis. Thank you, that you, you've said the right things. <laughs> so um, are there any other commissioner comments? Yeah, I have a couple. Oh, Vice Mayor Lund, I see your light on. Yes, sir, go ahead. I'll turn this off. You turn it off. So I just wanted to make some clarifications here. So if, if you take a look at the specific adults, they might have been out of Burt Construction's wheelhouse. Uh, one of them was relocating and extending a security fence. Doesn't sound like putting in solar panels to me. Um, removing and disposal of three inches of soil. So this was site preparation for the addition of, of adult three and adult four. And if they couldn't do that, they couldn't do adult three and adult four. So they would have been deficient anyway. Um, so if that makes any sense, a little more sense as to how they responded to this, because I've, I took a detailed look in to what they did, so. You always this, do, Vice Mayor Lunt. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so <laughs> this, is, this is the explanation as to, <laughs> as to why the bids ended up how, how they were. Yeah. If you can't do the work, if you can't do phase two, you can't get to phase three, which was at all three and four. Right. Thank you very much. Anybody else after Vice Mayor Lund? Nobody wants I think to speak he dropped after the mic. Vice Mayor Lund. <laughs> all right. Drop um, the mic, so. We've gone to public comments. We've had the commission discussion. If there's no other comments, roll call, please. We need a motion and a second. We need a motion and a second. Thank motion you. That might help. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lund? Yes. Mayor Vettigiotis? Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next item 17 is approved salary increases for charter officials. Um, I, you want me to do this? Yeah. You thank you. It. Okay. Um, I, I think everybody's gone through the, um, the backup. Um, there really isn't any percentage that the city manager put down. It's, it's basically up to the commission. It's the four, uh, three charter officials actually, uh, the city attorney is under uh, contract. It would be the uh, city manager's uh, salary adjustment, the city clerk collector's salary, salary adjustment, and also the internal auditor's uh, salary adjustment. Um, I think at that level is 5% is what was given to all the other uh, employees, um, department heads, so forth. Um, the only difference is Mr. Poulos has asked for a, an increase in the uh, uh, wage uh, schedule, salary schedule, uh, bump him up one, and then also uh, that, would, that would give him 5%, and then also uh, he's requested the normal, not requested, but uh, consider the additional 5% that the other um, uh, charter officials would have. Also, Mr. Poulos has given you a couple of examples of other internal auditors, if I'm not mistaken, um, that he has uh, provided you as far as comparison to his salary. I, I always want to do a little research, so I, I go and look at what the expected uh, CPI is. It, I think it was projected to be about 4.7%. So 5% really isn't a, um, what would you call it, a raise as much as just keeping up with, um, with inflation. So um, that's what we have, and I'd like to hear from the commissioners. Um, I mean, if you, if, if, from my perspective, I don't have an issue with a 5%, uh, given what the CPI is. And, and then also, um, Mr. Poulos came in here, he's actually came in less than what he'd asked for. 
and I, I think he's provided some justification for what he'd like for this time. It's really just a 5% difference from what the other charter officials, and that's just increasing his salary range uh, to make it more competitive. Um, Vice Mayor Lund. I don't have a, an issue at all with the 5%. I believe you're, you're pretty accurate with the CPI. It, it's basically just keeping everything on an even yeah. keel. Um, I sort of did some analysis and I'm outside of the, the, the 5% jump that, that Mr. Poulos is looking for with a, with a reclassification, um, it basically just puts them above the pay grade max for that thing. So I'm, I'm in total agreement. I think it deserves it. I do too. Um, Commissioner Carr. Yeah, no comments. Thank you. Commissioner Eisner. Commissioner Cuyas. No comments. Okay. Uh, public comment. Are there any uh, residents or uh, members of the public that are here this evening that would like to make a comment? IT, are there any remote access comments this evening? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do not have any raised hands at this time. Thank you. Um, given that, that there aren't any more comments, public or commissioner may have a motion to um, uh, approve the 5% uh, for the three um, charter officials plus the uh, salary range adjustment for the internal auditor and a second motion to approve the salary increases for the charter officials plus the 5% increase for the city auditor I'll second okay. roll call please Commissioner Cuyas yes Commissioner Eisner yes Commissioner Carr yes Vice Mayor Lund yes Mayor Vatikiotis yes okay um, uh, item 18, reconsideration of settlement of code enforcement lien. Um, Mr. Moore, are you going to be able to handle this for us this evening? Or? I'm capable of handling it, though. It was my understanding uh, staff was taking lead on there, that. There were some adjustments. Uh, I think the commission had some questions for additional information. I know Mr. Trask provided that. and It's Correct. in the backup. Okay. Yeah, there were requests for additional information. It's my understanding that Mr. Trask sent each of you correspondence um, as provided by the legal counsel for the uh, requesting party. Yeah. Um, ultimately, it is their request and it is theirs to substantiate for to your satisfaction. Okay, thank you. Um, sir, I'm going to ask, are you related to this as a property owner or representative? I'm the attorney representing the owner and the former owner. Okay, may I have your My name? My name is and Joseph and... Perlman, okay. attorney. Thank you. Um, do you. Are you here to answer any questions or? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, well, thank you. Know, can I make a statement first? Okay. I know I only please, have 10 Please minutes. do, that might help. Okay. Um, I know the city is concerned that there's a $91,000 lien here and why should we give a reduction? And let me tell you the reasons why. Right now that's a blight on 19, this property uh, uh, where the old Los Mexicanos restaurant used to be. If we don't, if you don't consider a reduction, what I'm afraid of and what I think is going to happen is that Mr. Arneson, the former lender slash owner who sold, who at the auction sold to Mr. Keidler, we're going to get into a battle out over this $90,000 lien. You're going to wind up in court. And Mr. Kyler, of course, can't go and get financing for the property because there's a lien on it. And this property is going to sit for another two or three years. So if you allow Mr. Kyler, if we can come to a resolution, let Mr. Kyler build that building, increase your tax base, get some revenues in, you're going to make up the shortfall that, that you're going to be, that I'm asking for, uh, in no time flat. Otherwise, it's going to sit here. It's going to be a blight on the uh, on the uh, U.S. 19 for for quite a while. Just quickly, last week, New York, Newport Ritchie, <coughs> City of Newport Ritchie had some property. My client had property on U.S. 19, Pasco Auto Sales, forty thousand dollar lien. My client died. Along comes a coffee house restaurant that's going to build down there. We settled that for fifteen thousand dollars just last week. Because they saw the long-term vision, they're going to have a building up there. It's going to look nice. They're going to increase their tax value. And that's what I'm asking the, this board to consider, the long-term effects. The, instead of having the short sight of the saying, we want our 91000 now, I'm asking for some consideration there. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Coleman. You. Um, 
since we've gone to Mr. Perlman, I'm gonna ask if there's any other uh, members of the public that'd like to make a comment at this time. If there aren't any IT, are there any remote access um, comments? I'd like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. <coughs> And we do not have any raised hands at this time, sir. Thank you. Um, let's go to the uh, commission. Uh, Vice Mayor Lunt. I'm, I'm sorry, could you clarify who you're representing? I'm representing both the former owner, Mr. Arneson, and Mr. Kreidloop of current. Oh, so you're representing, well, okay. So they're, in a they're in alignment right now. I'm not so sure after today, they'll be in alignment for. Well, I understand. For, so yeah. as, as I understand it, Mr. Kreidloop made an agreement with Mr. Arneson um, that Mr. Arneson be responsible for the code enforcement liens. That is correct. Was that agreement in writing, sir? No, that happened at the auction sale and it ha happened on the spot. There was no time to make a writing. Hmm. So that agreement was not in writing, it's a verbal agreement? That is correct. In your um, opinion, is that a binding contract? Well, it's binding because the, every auction that's, that's held by American Heritage Auctioneers, they record all the auctions, so it would be on a recording. So it's, it's, a, it's a binding contract um, that, I can't even, I'm trying to get the name straight here, I'm sorry, that uh, I understand neither of them caused the liens to be placed on the property, but it's a binding contract that Mr. Arneson agreed to be responsible for the code enforcement liens. That is correct. Are you suggesting now that he's trying not to be responsible for the code enforcement no, liens? No, what, what I'm saying is that Mr. Arneson has suffered a loss himself. I know the city says we don't want to take less unless somebody else has been hurt. Mr. Arneson's been hurt. He had to pay a tax lien. He never got his I money out I understand that, but okay. that's a normal practice of business. Mr. Arneson took a risk in handling this. He had a verbal contract that said he would accept responsibility for these liens, and now you're telling me that because of whatever whatever business, which were not responsible losses that he had, hmm. that that he's decided he doesn't want to be responsible for it, and he he wants to be only responsible for a portion of it. Is that not true? That is correct. And the, and I'm trying to give you the reasons why he's doing it. He's taking a hit himself, and he's. And he's hoping that the city understands that in the long-term effect, you're going to make more money with an increased tax base, get rid of a blight on the 19. Yeah, I understand. No more questions. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Commissioner Carr. Yeah, I mean, there's just a couple things that, um, Mr. Turney, uh, I feel like it was more of a threat when you first came out the door. Um, I don't think that's appreciated uh, to come out and make a threat that it's you have a chance to, for it to sit here for many more years because you're gonna have your two parties fighting amongst each other. Um, it's not a threat, it's just a fact of life. I'm, I've been doing this 55 years, so I know what's gonna happen. <laughs> so I'm not asking any questions right now, I'm just making okay. some comments. Um, with that, I have an understanding of I wanna see properties move on the property has most of it's been demolished and cleaned up which is what we want uh compliance um i don't know this, the person that owns it i don't know the person that sold it um obviously they're not very good at business i think it's pretty clear um so with that i mean i i want to see this moving forward i want to see the property redeveloped and uh, moving forward with that i looked at the backup um there's thirty thousand in escrow I'm assuming that's the risk that the owner was taking, and this is gonna be a question for you at this point. That's correct. Okay. Was that the agreement at, like, yeah. <laughs> cover up to 30,000? Yes. When they made the verbal agreement? Yes. So then the, the individual who was buying it in the auction knew there's a risk of another $60,000 that are out there then? Correct. Okay. I don't have any further comments or questions. Okay. Thank you. Carl, Commissioner Eisen. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Perman. I know you and I spoke on the phone. Um, we had a conversation that um, I kind of explained to you that uh, the buyer and seller both knew the obligation. And uh, I know you're coming here now asking uh, that we forgive the whole, you know, the 90,000 or um, forgive the 90 to 30. but. What I asked you on the phone 
was to come back with a number different than 30. Um, I know you had said to me you wanted me to come back at a number, but I <laughs> kind of told you I don't negotiate with myself. So uh, you still didn't come back with a number that I would be palatable to go and say okay with. Um, using this Newport Ritchie settlement, it was roughly a 40%, so I would say 36,000, 40% of 90, 36. So we're playing, let's make a deal, you've come up $6,000. Yes, sir. I have to go back to what the vice mayor said. Um, were, the, were the the buyer and seller not present when they made this deal? I, I just don't understand. It's like, is it the word on the street that Tarpon Springs negotiates and brings down the price just be on the asking? I mean, you know, people lost money in the stock market. Does that mean that they don't eat tonight? I mean, you know, your reasoning of what you're giving us is because he lost 250000 in a deal totally unrelated to Tarpon Springs, we should take a $60,000 hit. Does that sound correct, what you're asking? But, but, yeah, I'm asking that, but if we go to 36, it's a little less than that, but you it can is. give me a counteroffer now that I've given you my counteroffer. Well, let, let's <laughs> not go there right that's, now. That's <laughs> where I, <don't, laughs> I don't want to go there. <laughs> I, I would like you to give us a fair offer that we all could agree on the board and move forward. Okay. I'm in agreement to want to move forward and, and end it make a fair offer, and we could move forward. I, I'm not looking to play games with you. Okay, 50,000. That would have to be the vote by the, um, the board. Well, what we're gonna do is let's get through with the comments, and okay, then I'll sure. try and deal with a motion, and then we'll, and if we don't get a second or it denied, then we could do something else, but. I'm game. Okay, you have I any have other no comments? further questions. Okay, Commissioner Kulias. Sir, how much uh, did the, the cost of the construction or demolition of the, the property to bring it into compliance? Do you have those costs at all? The demolition cost was 35000 that I know. The, that was what Mr. Cridley, the current owner, paid. What Mr. Arneson, before he sold it at the auction, you know, had security, maintenance, et cetera. I don't know how much he was out of pocket for that specific uh, portion. Okay, and the, the intention of this new property owner is to build a bingo hall? Yeah, he owns the one things? just north of uh, the property, the subject property now. He owns the one just north of it. He'll, that's a lease, so he'll close that and build, he's building his own building here to, to house it. Okay, and uh, you had mentioned you're willing to make a settlement offer of 50 grand? That's today. what I want, yes. And um, I have no further questions. Thank okay. you. Thank Commissioner you. Carr. Yeah, Mayor, uh, I think a couple things to point out. The, what was the lien was originally around 90 something thousand. Um, the remediation of getting the property into compliance is 35,000, so that takes it 85. That around $55,000 in. I'm doing that math correct. Is that it? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm happy to support a, um, a $50,000. Um, and I'll make that motion. Better than 30, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I don't, uh, let, let's just test the waters. Uh, if I may have a, um, uh, a motion for, uh, settle this for $50,000, and if there's a second. Yeah, motion to settle will, for 50000 you, you, you made that yes. motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Is there any um, further discussion? We're going to have a roll call on that I, and see if that works. I think... Um, Mayor, do you, do you have another a, comment? I have think another we should comment. Move I, I keep seeing the city paper other people's mistakes, and I don't think it's correct. We have a fine schedule. It had a lien on the property. There was a contract in place that fully disclosed the lien, and then all of a sudden we're just going like, well, okay, you don't, you don't have to pay that, and uh, I disagree with that. Okay, well, we have a... Um, a, a motion and a second. Um, let me just ask one question. As a, as the chair, um, you would not settle for anything less than ninety thousand dollars. I would not. Okay, Commissioner Eisner. I'm in agreement to Vice Mayor's comments on this particular one. Um, I feel I got a 
for Mr. Perlman a uplift in good faith. So I would go with the, the motion for this particular one, but in the future, I want this to stop. No, oh, I, I agree with you on that. I don't, I, don't, I don't disagree with you at all. I think we need to have a policy uh, that to be able to provide the uh, city attorney in the future as far as negotiating fine reductions. I mean, that's basically the way we should be operating. There should be a policy for that. And I know the uh, city attorney tries the best he can and brings us what um, it would be the best, uh, I think, that, that he would be able to negotiate, but that doesn't mean um, that's something that we would be settled for, or if there's something that's a policy uh, from the commission, he could hand that to the person and say, look, it isn't gonna go anywhere until you get to reach this number. So I agree, I understand what you're saying. Um, all right, having said that, the hour is getting late. I'd like to, uh, we've got a, a motion and a second. Let's have roll call, please. Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lund? No. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. All right, Dan's approved Thank, mayor. Mr. Perlman, we're okay with 50,000? Okay. okay, thank you. Um, uh, do you want me to make, finish this up with Mr. Trask as far as the money, getting the money to it, the city? It, okay. Mr. Moore, I think we'll Moore, yes. convey I mean, whatever My office will be in needed. touch with, with you to facilitate completion of this process, sir. Thank you, Mr. Perlman. Keep saying next time, next time. All right, that's number 18. Number 19 is deferred. I agree with you. Um, number 20 is to um, authorize the city attorney to seek um, establishing the city of Tarpon Springs as an affected party in the, in the matter of the Anclote uh, River Park uh, restaurant in Pasco County. Um, that's something that, um, Ms. Vincent, is she here or is that something? Yes, she's there. Ms. Vincent, you're there? Uh, Ms. Vincent and I had a meeting with uh, Chairperson Catherine Starkey in Pasco County and um, we <coughs> conveyed to them that this is what we would be doing. They didn't seem to have an objection. I think we're already receiving emails as far as status of things, is that correct? Uh, yes, I think we uh, have at least an, one yes, email I've yes. seen. I don't know yes, what. I, I, I think I've seen the same. Maybe one, they've yes. changed their mind, but <laughs> I think it's important to um, establish ourselves as an affected party. Can you shed some light on this a bit, Ms. Vincent, as far as what needs where where, where the affected party is going to take us and and where we could actually um, have an effect on the outcome of the project? So uh, the project does require. Uh, some type of land use map amendment, you know, amendment to their comprehensive of plan. Um, uh, and I also think it probably requires some type of zoning, although in our discussions with them, it, it may not, it may be more of like a conditional use, but basically anything that requires an action that is, um, especially with the comprehensive <coughs> plan amendment, um, it gives us an opportunity as well as Pinellas County to, um, to provide input and, um, into that process, just like a citizen would come would come to us. So uh, that's what we you know intend to do, and we just really want to try to stay on top of the process. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's go to the public. Are there any public comments on this item, Ms. Thompson? Good evening. My name is Nancy Thompson. I reside in Pasco, and I'm one of the affected parties as well. I live in the Holiday Lake Estates, and I have some pretty grave concerns about what they're looking to do. This is a massive project, and they're looking to put in a 20,000 square foot restaurant within the river park itself, and then redevelop the entire waterfront with floating docks and other things, and add parasailing and wave runners and live music uh, during the week at night, and then all day on the weekends. I live about a third of a mile from there. I moved here because I love the Anclote area. So <coughs> I'm pretty disturbed over the fact that they're looking to do this. And I was hoping that maybe Tarpon Springs would come into it as far as being on the other side of the river because being in an unincorporated part of Pasco County, they don't really listen to the residents a lot. So I do plan on contacting Key Vista subdivision and Gulf Wind subdivision and trying to talk to some other people in my subdivision, which is about 2,500 homes. <coughs> don't think that the people there don't care. 
they do very much. The problem is that Pasco County is very bad about notifying us of any public meetings when they come up. They will announce them the day of, and a lot of people are working, they don't hear it on the news. Or they'll take out a little tiny ad in the newspaper for a public hearing and we don't know it exists. One of the other things they will do for a public hearing is instead of doing it in Newport Ritchie for people that are affected here, they will put that public hearing in Dade City on the other side of the county. They're not great about being out in the open as far as their contact. So I would urge you to stay on top of them because they kind of do things under the table. And I'm hoping that perhaps, you know, I know that we would not be represented by Tarpon Spring, but I would like to stay in touch with Tarpon Spring on developments and how you guys are coming along with your concerns with PASCO. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Are there any other public comments on this item? This is the uh, restaurant resort at Anklo River Park. Okay, uh, IT, are there any um, remote access comments on this item? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raised hand, so I'll allow the first person in. Thank you. If you could please state your name and address for the record. Hi, am I on? Yes, sir. Hello? Okay, uh, Peter Lackis, 514 <coughs> Ashland Avenue. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I drove out to the Anklo River Park this weekend. That place is a passive recreational place for people to come and enjoy picnics and swimming. They do have a large, large boat launch, which I would think would be a problem when you're having already the regular weekenders and boat launchers, including this, what's going to be there. But more importantly, uh, where they're planning on putting this is within the historical area of the Spanish Wells, and this is a historical site. So I would recommend, highly recommend, you contact the Division of Historical Resources to let them know what's going and being involved in this because they may have a say in this. But we definitely need to be an affected party because there's traffic issues. That road is an old two-lane road. You go out there, you're driving straight along uh, what is it, uh, Bailey's Bluff Road or something, one that runs along the Anklope around by the power plant, and people are passing all the time. Uh, you're going to have congestion. Also, the fact that they're wanting to use the trail as a public means of getting people from their resort to that. That trail was meant for pedestrians and bicycles, and now they're going to want to be putting golf carts on there. There's hazards all over the place, so it's imperative that we coordinate with Pinellas County, as Renee mentioned just a moment ago, getting them involved. I'm not sure how much they're aware of it, but we definitely need to communicate with their parks and recreation or whoever else would be responsible for also applying as an affected party with us. So this is definitely uh, something that will affect us, even though it's not in our county. As the mayor mentioned once before, we're on the north side where we're ignored by Pinellas and on the south side, uh, you know, we got Pasco on the north and they don't pay any attention to us. So we definitely need to uh, put an affected party status in. And we'd like to maybe have uh, on the website any communications or any updates with regards to this project so the citizens also can be aware and maybe we can also put our input into the process. Thank you for your time and thank you for doing this. We greatly need to protect the Anklote River and what it provides to the city of Tarpon Springs as an economic and uh, cultural uh, relic or cultural resource for us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Delacus. Are there any other comments, IT? And we do not have any other raised hands at this time. Okay. Um, let's go to uh, Commissioner Comments, Vice Mayor Lund. I can think of a myriad of reasons why Tarpon Springs and Pinellas County is an affected party in this case. Um, just the idea of the congestion on the river, the increase in personal watercraft, parasailing, 
music at night, music all day long on the weekends, um, having, I, I live on the water. You can hear things across the water pretty well. I'm pretty sure that the neighbors that are directly adjacent across the, uh, the enclote are going to not be happy with all the noise. I know as, as a regular boater that I'm not going to be happy with all the traffic and all the, and the tourist stuff, but that's, you know, that's from my position. I'm sure the, the citizens of Tarpon Springs want to speak out on this more as we go by, and I think we definitely should go for whatever we can get as far as the factory party status. Thank you. Commissioner Carr. Yeah, I wasn't here for the conversation during the last meeting, so um, Mr. City Attorney, do you have any information that you can share on with me on um, how the City of Tarpon Springs can be considered an effective party in this situation? My understanding of the city's interest in this is with its, to the extent its territorial waters and properties are within proximity to the proposed development, that that proximity is a basis for its, um, for its, as an initial um, element uh, for its involvement. Um, since the last meeting, it's my understanding that uh, the city attorney, uh, Trask, has provided additional uh, basis with reference to statutory um, basis for its involvement, its potential involvement um, by virtue of Florida statute, and that was sent to the council on uh, August 20. Well, sorry, I'm trying to find the precise date. There was correspondence sent um, precisely for, uh, providing its justification for its involvement based on statutory authority for the city's ability as a municipality where there is a proposed. Um, where there may be a proposed land use redesignation as uh, discussed by staff that may provide us a basis. Now again, if that development happens in a manner that is different than what staff anticipates and contemplates, that may change the process they adopt and may very well um, affect all the city's ability to be involved. Um, to the surprise of some, change circumstances, changes analysis. Um, so the analysis in, in this case is given the proposed change land uses, et cetera, there is statutory basis for the city's involvement. Okay. Uh, I mean, so, some of these items, we as a city, I don't think have any, shouldn't have any say in some of these items that are listed here. Um, the safety of the navigation of the, the river is obviously a big one. Noise is a big one. Um, so for those reasons, I'm, I'm going to support this tonight. But there's certain things that it's not our county, it's not our city. Um, but we have to think about the impacts that that could have on our city. And that's the part that I want to focus on here. Not because they're gonna have parasailing or they're gonna have more traffic in Pasco County. That's the part I'm not concerned about. I'm more concerned about the safety aspect of it. Um, and also, w what will it impact Tarpon Springs on? And I think that's the part we need to focus on as a, as a city for being an effective party. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the diagram of what they designed, um, they're looking to change the whole um, area of the river. They even have a uh, fishing pier that comes out almost to my house. Um, and I am an affected party. I live directly across from them. I hear the music from Miss Vicky's daily. I don't want to hear their music. Um, but I did also take it upon myself. This is not an evidentiary hearing, correct? Um, I took it upon myself to call the Army Corps of Engineers. I spoke with them on the phone. They do not have any application in as, as it is right now, but they would be um, interested in what they're planning on doing um, because it would involve the Army Corps of Engineers and they're just on the record, they're about three to five years out from any sort of permitting, if they could, but it would be very hard to get that accomplished, what they're looking to do on the outskirts uh, by the water. I did make, uh, make them aware that we seem to be the people that are responsible financially for the well-being of the Anclote River. And this would not be a good place, of course, to put this type of facility. They have uh, transient boats parked there they have the uh, power plant there. There's a half a million different reasons as 
vice mayor said for why I would not want it to be there, so I'm gonna go along and hopefully approve us as an affected party, and I will continue to follow up with the Swift uh, Army Corps of Engineers. So, thank you. Commissioner Kuliash. I, I agree with the concerns of this board and looking for our board to seek uh, affected party status. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I, I, um, <clears throat> what was the number you used, Vice Mayor Lund? A million? Reasons, <laughs> a million reasons. Myriad. 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> there are, um, you know, it, it's going to be from a passive single-use park to a mixed use in terms of commercial recreation. Ms. Vincent didn't mention there's a thousand-foot waiver that the Pasco County is going to have to approve for itself to be able to serve alcohol in the park. Any other park, it's a thousand foot distance. So there's so many things that are strange about this resort that they're giving up open recreational space for commercial activity. And, um, and, and there's absolutely no, now, you know, we do share people. I mean, we have boaters that launch their boats at Anklo River Park. And we do have people from Pasco County that come to Sunset Beach and, and Howard Park. And what I suspect is going to happen with real estate being taken out of the Anklo River Park, and I think it's going to turn out turn off a lot of um, uh, moms and dads with kids that just want a simple picnic and that sort of thing, to, to expose themselves on all this other nonsense. Um, we're going to wind up with more of <coughs> those residents, uh, which would be welcomed as long as there's room here in Tarpon Springs at Sunset Beach and Howard Park. M many of the days um, we already shut down Howard Park anyway. So there's a lot of concerns I have. The river itself is worth $250 million worth of revenue to us each year. Um, there's no nighttime law enforcement. The restaurant's going to be open at night. There's no law enforcement on the river. We've got commercial boats coming, transiting out and coming in the river at night. I mean, there's a lot of just issues. One resident is concerned with the jet boat rentals that, that, that they're going to be, the, especially the people that are new to jet skis are going to want to be in that area behind the uh, barrier islands along the riverside drive uh, shoreline mm -hmm. behind the barrier islands where it's nice and shallow and quiet and then driving everybody, the residents where over I there. That, is that where you are, Commissioner? That's Eisner? exactly okay, where so, I live. Um, anyway, um, so, so there's a lot of aspects to this we need to deal with. And of course, we're going to learn more about this as we go. Is there, um, is, is any restaurant size objectionable? I don't know. Uh, but certainly what's being proposed right now is. So um, I, I do have a question for Mr. Mora. Um, it, the process is basically going to be um, an, a, a letter from our attorney um, referencing whatever statutes that uh, Mr. Trask has already cited to us mm -hmm. and then make a request and then we await for a response from their attorney, their legal attorney. Is that the way it normally works or do we have to show up at a meeting and request to be... Um, I just wanted to let you finish. I didn't yeah, no, I'm, I'm finished uh, mid sentence. Okay. <laughs> so you uh, can finish the a, sentence. A few things I want to clarify that in, in answering uh, Member Carr's inquiry before, ordinarily a affected party status is based on proximity and a series of factors dating to case law going back as far as the 1970s. I think it's the Renault case or something along those lines. In this case, it is tied to uh, the Florida statute on a land use change, comprehensive plan changes, um, and, and that was in fact circulated to. Um, the uh, council on August 24th at 10 a.m. from Mr. Trask. Uh, beyond that analysis, what we w what is being proposed is that correspondence would be sent from the office of your city attorney on behalf of the city, communicating a desire to be deemed a uh, affected party and provided all all requ requisite notices of any or any published published notices going forward in this process. As far as whether that means we would have to appear at hearings or be able to submit written submissions, that is in part going to be a function of their process and whatever rules of procedure they have and also where they are in that process. At this part, it's somewhat in its infancy. Um, it's, it's somewhat nascent. It has, there's not you know, a, a complete full plan and here's the comp plan amendment and the policy and objectives and goals um, that, that they're proposing to amend. So as that um, process matures, perfects itself, that will inform what role the city has and when, and ultimately what opinions it de decides. As you said, we, 
Um, is there any configuration? I don't know. And similarly, um, what involvement the city will have will vary based on their rules. Right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, we've gone through the public comments. We've gone through commission comments. I would like to have a motion and a second to authorize the city attorney to seek affected party status for um, the Pasco County project, the Anclote River Park restaurant. Motion to approve. Second. Roll call, please. Commissioner Koyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay. We will work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We're going to go to um, item 21, request to negotiate development agreement application 2296, choice hotels. Uh, Roosevelt Boulevard. Um, uh, how do Vincent, you want to handle this? Okay. Have Ms. Vincent start to talk Ms. about Ms. Vincent, yeah. okay. Ms. Vincent. Uh, thank you. I'll just give you a very brief overview. Um, as you know, um, the, uh, the developer who's here tonight um, has been before the board uh, previously uh, seeking a conditional use approval for a hotel project um, on, at the Sponge Docks on the property that's kind of generally known as the Mena property. Um, that proposal um, and its iterations uh, basically failed and so the applicant is now requesting um, uh, to negotiate a development agreement um, on that same property for a hotel. Um, I'll just I'll hit the highlights and then I'll let the applicant or however you want to handle this uh, fill in the blanks but um, th the proposal would be for you know a property if a hotel property no less than 80 units um, the development agreement would address such things as you know, potential for public parking. Um, the it, it, it would outlaw outline also all the obviously the necessary uh, permitting steps that would have to take place, which would be a conditional use and a site plan, um, and and then importantly, you know, provide for the architecture um, that would contribute to the to the historic nature of the area. So it really is a, the, the, the intent of the development agreement is to kind of capture all these elements and, and bring it together in one document. Um, it does not bind the, the board. Um, at, you know, at, so I, and I'll defer, to, obviously, to the attorney on, on, the, on the, the particulars of how the development agreement operates. But for this evening, this request to negotiate is just that. Um, it is a, an open request, and um, there's no, you know, either you will approve it or not, and um, and we move on from there. If you do approve it, then they'll do a full submission, and we'll start the negotiation. So, thank you, Ms. Vincent. Um, Ms. Cole, I know you're here. This isn't quasi judicial, but please feel free to come forward and make a statement if you'd like. Good evening, Katie Cole, representing uh, the developers at uh, 600 Cleveland Street, Clearwater, Florida. AV Florida Holdings is my client. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Commissioner. At the last uh, hearing when we were here before you to request the approval of the conditional use, uh, the mayor mentioned and asked about entering into a development agreement. And at the time, because it was a pretty um, black and white request, that the development agreement hadn't been something that was requested. But, or considered. But during that time period of look, working with staff on the conditional use and working with the community, uh, Mr. Fritzia and his uh, wife are very willing to get feedback from the commission and from the community. There was not a lot of consensus with respect to the architectural design. Um, there was consensus that the building was too big, but not really um, any consensus with respect to what appropriate size might be. Um, there was a request about the out parcel, uh, what's known as the out parcel that you all know that's currently used as some surface parking, whether that could be accessible to the city in the future for future parking, or whether that could be required parking for the ho um, hotel. I think from uh, the developer's standpoint, and he can speak to this if, if you don't mind entertaining him for a moment. There is a desire for he and Choice Hotels to be here in Turpin Springs at the Sponge Docks. What that, prop, what that building looks like 
certainly willing to work with the city and the constituents to come to an agreement with. But the only thing that um, would be a minimum standard would be having 80 rooms. It's difficult. Um, you all saw the plans before. An 80-room hotel, as was described in the request, would reduce the pro uh, hotel down by about 20%. It would take a floor off the hotel, but in removing that floor from the hotel would likely make it a little longer. Um, so it does would look a little bit different on the site. Uh, you know, we had talked to staff before that maybe a taller building in some places might be acceptable if it was smaller. There are all sorts of things you can do with mass, but the bottom line is to make a project financially feasible and to make it worthwhile for a hotel to be constructed in this area on a site like this, an 80 room minimum size would be necessary. Yeah. We've heard from the city manager that he had gotten feedback that that still might be too large. So hopefully tonight we can get some specific direction about that. Um, Mr. Fritcher would also like to say a few words. Good evening, Mr. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for hearing me and my wife again. Um, maybe we make it four in the morning today, but we will see. Um, I, I heard comments, I heard comments from you, I heard comments from the public. Um, first, I wanna say to make sure that everybody understands, if we were to build a hotel, it would be owned by me and my wife. Choice just is a franchise which supports, you know, certain systems, certain functions. Um, as I, as uh, Katie already said, we would reduce the size of the, the building. We're taking off uh, between tw 28 to 26 rooms, right? That's more than 20%. A hotel has to be functional, right? Everything has a cost, building, land, operations. Land is not cheap. Right, so that's why we cannot do 60 or 70 rooms. It just does not work. We also wouldn't have the support from Choice Hotel Group at that point, and Choice Hotel Group deems Tarpon Springs a great location, especially the Sponge Dogs. The Sponge Dogs itself have a million one hundred thousand people visited every year, and the only place you can stay in proximity is Airbnbs. Um, nobody controls Airbnbs. We don't know if people pay taxes or not. We certainly would pay taxes to the city as an income stream for the city. <clears throat> also, I would like to mention, like uh, we mentioned last time, uh, the Merchant Association collected 160 signatures from people who have businesses on, on the sponge docks as well as on downtown. Uh, I think that sh shows uh, great support for our cause. Um, my wife and, and me are willing to do anything you guys like to, to ask us, as long as it's feasible. We would share architecture control with you guys. We, right now, there is no guidelines in Tarpon Springs, right? But we are saying now, and we said that before, right? If you tell us what we want, we build it, right? I just want to point this out. Um, it, it was said that uh, 60, 65 rooms, something like this, it was conveyed to us, would be preferable, right? But the difference between an 80 room hotel and a 60 room hotel is, is not that dramatic. And uh, David could attest to that what that means in building that. I also would like to mention that the, the piece of land is, uh, is uh, undeveloped. People park their trailers on there randomly, right? Um, as I brought a picture to the last hearing. Um, As, as, as I mentioned this before, my wife and me want to be here, right? And we are willing to work with uh, Tarpon Springs and the citizens of Tarpon Springs in, in any fashion, uh, again, as long as it makes financial sense. Um, we're going to remove also the balconies looking west because some neighbors complain there's going to be balconies, people are going to 
be on the balconies, they're gonna be talking, they're gonna be listening to music, so we're not invading their space. Um, we had a traffic study done. The traffic study was redone and redone and redone, and um, it said that it wouldn't cause any harm to uh, the sponge dogs. This was, was asked for, if there is any other request, we will, can do these traffic studies again. We are willing to do this. As I said, we're willing to do anything you like. Um, I, I, I hope we can have an open forum today and negotiate that. Um, my wife and me, I think, showed the willingness to be here. We wanna be here. We uh, don't have any architectural drawings tonight because uh, we, we did three sets of drawings and uh, it's obviously not cheap to do something like that. And we want your input, right? How you would like it to look, then us dictating this step. Okay. Um, yeah, Elisa, can you think of anything? Mr. Fritsch, if we can move on with the public comments, I would appreciate it. I, I, I understand, I think all the commission understands what your interests are. Um, we just need to finish the meeting um, it, it a, you know, in a reasonable time and, and we've got a lot more to go. Let, then let me ask you just one question. Would you like to hear from David on what the difference is between 80 and 60 rooms? Not at the moment. Um, I just, uh, what I want to do is get a sense from the public, come to the commission. I also have a question, a procedural question for Ms. Vincent that I'd like for her to answer. This is just for authorizing a to proceed with a development agreement. It doesn't approve anything architectural or anything, just, yeah, yeah. okay. M M Mr. Mayor, I, un I understand that, right? right? My wife and me engaged with the city of Tarpon in February, right? Uh, I have the land under contract, right? Um, at one point, my, my hand needs to be played, right? You understand that, right? Yeah. Where I either purchase it or I have to put money hard, right? And I, 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 again, we showed our willingness to be here with what we have done so far, I and I hope Mr. you understand Fritchie. that. Thank yeah. you. Ms. Vincent, if you could just give us a snapshot. As far as the development agreement, the authorization, we proceed to a development agreement, then it looks like um, will converge to something that may be reasonable to bring to the commission. Then where do we go from there, just in a quick snapshot? So um, once you authorize the request to negotiate, they have to then submit, there's a, in our code it says what you have to submit. Um, that gets reviewed by the technical review committee um, and then basically the city manager, we have to report to the city manager and he comes back to the board and says, okay, we're ready to, to we're ready to go to negotiate essentially. So, um, I don't know, see if I got the code in front of me here. Basically what I'm trying to make sure is that whatever the commission approves or denies tonight, they understand what the end game is as far as if they approve something, uh, not it does, all it does is it, it allows them to go ahead and sub, do the next step in the process, which is submit all the documentation that's required to begin that development, that, that negotiation. Fine. If they don't submit anything, it dies. No, but let's say a development agreement is approved. Then where does it go from that point? Once a, if, if, so we go through the develop, if, if the development agreement actually gets approved, then, um, then there's a time period that they have to, uh, it's gonna lay out what, other, what else is necessary, the conditional use, the site plan. Um, whatever, whatever those requirements of the development agreement are, they'll be, those have to be laid out and then they have to go through that, the, that process. I, I understand all that, okay. but does it, the development agreement, once it gets approved here, does it go to the PNZ board or does it go oh, to okay. the PNZ? Oh, okay, no, it, it, it goes to the PNZ board as it, in, the, in the approval process before it comes to you for a final approval. So essentially, um, the city manager has to report back the status of negotiations to you within 90 days of the TRC review. Um, and then it's just, a, it's a negotiation process at that yeah. point. Once you get to a, you know, a agreed upon, if you will, agreement, 
then the planning and zoning board conducts the first public hearing and then it comes to the board for final approval. Okay. Did that, sorry. Did that, and then okay. we go through the normal site plan and the Correct. whole thing. Okay, Correct. got it, thank you. Um, let's go to public comments. Anita Protus, 901 Bayshore Drive. I just wanna make sure that we will not vacate Hill Street. And at the last meeting, y'all said, we would save it. But if you remember these last three weeks, with all the rains and the high tides, especially at the bayou, it was beautiful, it was so full. If you ride down Hope Street to the bottom of the hill, the docks were flooded. You need Hill Street for the cars to go down and go around Roosevelt to come back up to Hope Street to get out of the area on high ground and you couldn't even go around Canal Street, so you had to cut up Grand Boulevard and get out. So I just wanna make sure as they do their development, we don't vacate Hill Street. It is a historic street. I can bring you pictures of the wagons coming up full of sponges from when they used to uh, dock the sponge boats in that area. It is vital to this community and we need to save it for the uh, people to be able to get in and out. And especially when we have uh, concerts or art shows or anything down on though the Canise Boulevard, you can't get down to the end and who's gonna back up that hill to try to get out. We need to save Hill Street. Okay. Are there any other public comments? <laughs> yeah, I'll, sure. Ms. Dr. Vuk, okay, you're going to read that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. She's converting an email to a verbal. No, I know. Yeah. It's a conversion. Uh, Tina Bukovalis, uh, 115 Athens Street. I, I really don't see the point here. Um, we're still ignoring the will of city residents and boards. It was clearly expressed at a variety of earlier meetings for a smaller hotel, like we're talking 50 rooms, <coughs> appropriate to the Greek Town Historic District, architectural scale and style. Mr. Fritcha requests to negotiate an agreement for a hotel no less than 80 rooms and four stories, including the first floor parking. This would create significant adverse impacts to historic resources and set a dangerous precedent for development. The hotel is incongruent with Greek town scale, with 300 plus one or two Okay, Greek Town has 300 plus one or two story contributing resources. Also, the hotel will generate about 750 daily car trips on tiny residential streets that are now overburdened during tourist season and events, or on Dodecanese and Roosevelt, which, as you heard, are flooded are, and, crowd, and they're often crowded. Alt 19 is 0.5 to point nine miles away. That may be an adequate road, but these little tiny roads in the residential district can't handle that volume of traffic. And I'm on one of those streets, so I am an affected party. With negative traffic and heritage impacts, it is inconsistent with our comp plan goals to protect historic resources and with the strategic area plan, which has promoted balancing the needs of tourists, residents, and working waterfront. We should defer any new projects to comply with our new revised plans. When applying for a five-story, 106-room hotel, Mr. Fritcher repeatedly said a smaller hotel would lose money. As this request proves, smaller hotels can be profitable. It also shows that local concerns are somewhat irrelevant to him or his attorney, 
whose work profile boasts of experience pushing development through community objections and city regulations. Since we are clearly attractive to hoteliers, we should await a proposal that is in our best interests and, and consistent with what we want as smart development that respects our cultural heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bukovalis. Who's next? Ms. Ms. Wynn? Um, Sherry Wynn, I, 1214 Riverside Drive, and I'm um, here representing the merchants. I'm, I'm a board member on the merchant board. And, and the reason everybody else isn't here tonight, they just figured it probably only needed one of us, and most of the board is out of town, to express, I just hope that it's a possibility that you might at least let the development agreement take a chance that maybe there's, there's a compromise somewhere. I mean, I know you're sure there isn't, and maybe many of you have decided there's no way that's in the world this is gonna work. <coughs> But when people say that the, re the citizens of our town don't want this overall, I just don't know what they've done with the citizens that, like me, uh, all the merchants, all the, the businesses, all the working people. I, I mean, we count too. We, many of us live in the docks. I mean, we have restaurant owners in the docks and we have all kinds of people. I mean, this is my home. And, a lot of people just like me, um, we want a hotel. Uh, I'm hoping that at least you've got someone here that says, I'm willing to try to make this work. If it doesn't work, this gentleman lost a lot of time and probably a lot of money. But maybe, maybe in my mind there's that slim chance that, that he came back and he's willing to try again and go down and it just, I'm just hoping you'll let it let it take a chance that maybe between working with the city and, and figuring out what is architect, can I afford what they're asking me to do? Can I put this together? Is it gonna make, the, gonna make it work? Just remember, it, it isn't just a small group of people, and I know many of you are Greek, but it isn't just the Greek community. There's a big community here. We're not all Greek and there's nothing wrong. We could be whatever nationality, but we still count. We're just not nobody. You just have to look that there are other people besides a few and, and give it a chance. And maybe it'll come back to you and you'll vote no again. But, all you, but, but at least they tried and maybe, that, maybe together, maybe we'll be lucky. Maybe something good will come out of it. So I'm just asking you to think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wynn. Are there any other public comments? Ms. Landrum. Good evening, Mayor and Board of Commissioners. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the residents. Once again, I, I really do appreciate that very much. I promised myself I was not gonna speak tonight, but here I am. We do need a hotel in Tarpon Springs, but we do not need it in that area. We need it on Alt 19. I, I'm in that area several times a week, a bunch of times. I ride my bike, we walk, we drive, we patronize the merchants on the docks almost exclusively. I never shop at a mall. When I need something, we go down to the docks. We eat there, we shop there. I want all of you to be successful. But that's just not the right place for a hotel, the traffic. My, the, the area around my home was completely flooded several days this week. We rode the neighborhoods and could only ride on the sidewalks on our bikes because the streets were flooded. The traffic down there, you, we can't even ride a bicycle because there's par cars parked on one side of the road and so only one car can travel down most of the roads around where you're <coughs> proposing your hotel. Have you traveled there? Have you been there during the day when, when it's crowded and the docks are full of people? I don't know. I would love to see a hotel, but not in that location. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Landrum. Is there any other person? Okay. Um, 
IT, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to speak on this item, please raise your hand and you'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raised hand, so I'll allow the per first person in. And if you can state your name and address for the record. Good evening. Peter Delacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. I would like to point out a couple of facts. First off, in Mr. LaCourse's memo, it says you need to consider if the 80 room hotel under any circumstances of design or concession is appropriate. Otherwise, you don't approve it. I don't know how many times we have to tell these people that a huge hotel is not what is needed there. Secondly, I have to contend with Mr. Frisch's comment earlier about the land costs. He's applying a Santorini development. And if you look on the Pinellas County property appraiser's website, he bought the main property on the east side of Roosevelt on both sides of Hill Street. It shows in June of 2004 for $600,000. And the out parcel was bought in July of 2005 for $440,000. So when he's talking about a contract and land costs, uh, from what I can see, their land costs are already fixed. Secondly, we have spoken about the need for a hotel, but a hotel of this type at that location is not appropriate. If anything, as it's been mentioned before previously times, a hotel of this size and magnitude needs to be on the corner of alternate 19 and the Deccanese. I'm not sure what's going on with the property there. Maybe Mr. Santorini or Mr. Frisch can do a property swap or something and put his hotel there. But this location for that size of a hotel is not appropriate. So I would recommend instead of wasting everybody's time, staff and the applicant and their costs, just tell them, no, we're not going to prove something more than 50 units or 45 or whatever you come to determine. But 80 rooms, at least 80 rooms, is not appropriate. Also, the other thing I have to remind the board about is since back in uh, February of 2019, the development agreements and conditional use language was changed. So any development agreement now can be for 10 years and the conditional use changes were done where it was changed from a building permit acquired to a site plan submitted and then another 12 months. So basically they can sit on this for a long time and the city will be tied for years with this development agreement if it isn't the proper one. So I would say at this point, to save everybody time, money, and effort, just tell them that we're only going to look at a 50-unit hotel. If you can't provide it at that location, then you'll need to move on. But they, from the property records, show they already own this land. So I, I, I'm kind of curious as to why he says there's a contract for a property. So I know my time's run out, but I would recommend... Uh, denying a uh, development agreement based on an 80, at least 80 unit hotel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Delacus. Are there, uh, IT, are there any other um, comments? And we do not have any other raised hands at this time. Okay, let's go to the commission. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Lawrence. <coughs> okay, so um, I actually have some questions. Is that allowed or just comments at this particular time? So, do you have questions? I have questions about how we construct development agreements and what's under negotiation and by whom. Um, can Ms. Vincent address yes. that? Ms. Vincent? I'm sorry to call you up here again, Renee. That's okay. This is not quasi judicial. I will do my so. best to answer your question. So, if you authorize the request to negotiate, then they have to submit a full development proposal. Um, and I'm just trying to read through, you know, the des so the desired, basically what you're probably gonna end up with is some sort of, you know, conceptuals again, that, you know, address the architecture, the height, the massing, the scale, um, you know, whether or not, you know, if you want to require that, you know, 
they have to have the full site plan, you know, run with it. I mean, it, it, you have a lot of options with the development I understand agreement. that point. What, yeah. I'm, what I'm trying to get is, so they give us a conceptual viewpoint. At what specific stage, not, not that I've done this before, what's negotiable? The size of the building at that time? Everything. The architecture, everything's negotiable. Pretty much everything is negotiable at that point. Well, it's an agreement as any other. If, if, it's, it's an agreement like any other. The parties can enter into it willfully and limit themselves or, or grant either party rights and privileges as you would uh, in any contract. Okay. Um, all right, so that kind of explains it. Um, at what point in time do affected parties get involved in development agreements? During the public hearing process. So, I mean, after the development agreement is already substantially along, and we have public meetings at the PNZ, is the first time they're allowed to get involved? It says, okay, so. Reading the process here. I haven't done one of these in a long time, so. I know, I understand. Um, Take your time. I, I, I ask questions fast, but the answers don't have to be that quick. I would say that, I mean, the first, the first public hearing on the process does appear to be at the, the planning and zoning board, okay. but you know, you're going, the city manager has to come back. The city manager is the prime person that does the negotiating for these development agreements with input, you know, from whomever he seeks to get input from that. And at some point he has to, you know, if he has an acceptable, what he deems to be an acceptable agreement, then he brings that back to the board. And that, so that's a public process. Obviously, you know, you would probably, you know, the public would be able, you know, it would be, may be able to participate in that. Um, it's not, let's see, the public hearing requirements before entering into amending or revoking a development agreement, city shall conduct a minimum of two public hit hearings. Notice of intent to consider shall be advertised seven days before each public hearing. Uh, so there's a specific set of requirements, but it looks like the first real public hearing noticed would be the, pl the planning and zoning board meeting. Okay, so we're basically obviating the public's interaction with, with this whole thing until just about the end. I, I mean, it's I, in the that, approval stage at that point. I'll have to just defer. I mean, I'm reading from, this, from the statutory I requirements. I I'm so. not trying to. Yeah, I understand. I won't, I won't hold you to the fire on, <laughs> on any of this. Yeah, I definitely I'm just, didn't write I'm this. just trying to logically go through <clears throat> in my mind. Sure. Um, so, and affected parties aren't considered until that time as well, until it, until it gets into a quasi-judicial po exactly. position. Um, all right, so, and that's, that's all my questions. I have some comments, so thank you, Renee. No, no comments, then. Pardon me? No comments. No comments? Okay. No, oh, no, you, I you, can do, have, you can do oh, comments. He says he no. does have yeah, comments. This isn't quasi-judicial, so I mean, you, you can make your comments. I, think I, that's I do have comments. Please go ahead. This is not quasi-judicial. Yeah, I know. I, I understand that. So, so have free have form. At have at it. Um, I happen to agree with Mr. Delacus as far as the 2019 comp plan changes. I'm really not fussy about looking at development agreements until we amend that comp plan. Because anything we do now is going to fall under the current comp plan, and I don't think that's that's where we want to be. So that's my one comment. I appreciate you coming here. I appreciate what you're trying to do. I don't think an 80-room hotel is is generally accepted by the by the citizens. Not from what we heard when we went through the last round. I think we came back and said 60 or 50 or somewhere in the neighborhood. I'd have to actually check the notes. Um, regardless, there's affected parties. There's residential neighborhood in the T4A sector. They're right next door, so they're affected. If they don't have a voice in this and we still need to play the comp plans, I, I'm not fussy about going through this tonight at all. Okay. Let's go to Commissioner Carr. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, I think this one's a pretty easy one to do. It's a, it's a negotiation. 
if we can't come to an agreement, um, then at that point it doesn't move forward. Uh, so there's a couple things I just want to point out. The city has a willing developer wanting to work with the city and find a solution that fits within the area. That's something you don't have very often. Um, so I, I appreciate you coming back. I appreciate you trying to go a different approach. Um, that's something that I don't think the city should take lightly. Uh, the comments are they should build an Ultra 19. That's fine. I mean, someone will do that I'm, at some point. I'm sure it will be redeveloped on Ultra 19. Uh, but for whatever reason, they want to develop this area at the west end of the sponge docks. Um, a couple things that I think need to be addressed in the development agreement is the height and not necessarily the stories of the hotel. Um, I could care less how many stories it is. It's ultimately the height that's going to be the biggest factor. Uh, you can make a two-story building as high as a four-story building probably, right? So you have to be careful on that, saying if we're going to agree upon a certain height as a city or put that in the negotiations, I think it really needs to focus on the height at the end of the day. Um, the no balconies make sense, and then from an architectural standpoint, is you don't want a large block building along the frontage of the road. You want that broken up with different depths to insinuate not a large building that's just sitting there that you have some different, um, I don't know the architectural terms for it, but when you have some uh, breaking it up a little bit, it really breaks up the, the feel of a large building. Um, so with this one, I, I, I do think it's advantageous for the city to move forward. Um, I'm not one to say, I can't say what an 80-room hotel room looks like, or I'm sorry, an 80-room hotel versus 60-room hotel looks like. Um, that's really just from the design standpoint that the, I think the applicant has to put together. Um, do they meet the, the other question is, do they meet the intensity uh, for the property as well for that? Do they have that right to develop it to that many rooms as well too? So those are some of the questions you want to ask uh, during this process. and then. The city manager is going to be able to negotiate with this, the um, applicant's attorney and the applicant during this whole process. So if you want to talk to the city manager and say, city manager, we want to see these, this, this, and this, or maybe you don't want any hotel in this bunch, Docs, that's, that's up to you. Um, but if you have these concerns, then tell the city manager and he's going to try to work that in the negotiations. So um, I, I just want to reiterate, you don't have developers very often that just come in and say, this is, we want to do whatever you want us to do. We just want a hotel. Tell us what it looks like tell us the, the, where the footprint needs to be, things along those lines. Generally, it's a developer coming saying, this is what we want to do, take it or leave it. And we want to push it down your throat, right? So this is a, a unique <coughs> situation here, I think, when the developer is really willing to work with the city. Um, and it's un, I, I would say it's an unusual situation. Um, but I'm, I'm in support of the development agreement. Like I mentioned, a couple of things that I have concerns about. Uh, the height is one of them. I don't want to see anything higher than what's currently in the neighborhood today. Um, you have to have the break. You have to break up the building somehow. Um, the no uh, balconies on the west side made a lot of sense, uh, and there will be some other things as well too that need to be discussed. But if I say 80 rooms or 60 rooms, I, I can't really. I don't know what that looks like difference-wise tonight. I mean, I have nothing to go off of. And again, we're not. It's not a guarantee. It's going to like it's going to. There, there's no guarantee tonight. It's just moving to the next step for the applicant to. To hopefully come up with a great project that's going to benefit the whole city from tax revenues and businesses and residents. Thank you. Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> this one is a, uh, is a repeat to me. Um, I want to read to you the uh, letter from Mark, from the city manager, Mark Lacoris. I want to bring to your attention that a request to negotiate is for no less than 80 room hotel, three stories above parking. In my talks with Mr. Fritch before this request, I advised him that a development agreement for a hotel in the 50 to 60s room count would be appropriate based on the Board of Commissioners' comments on the previous hotel request. The Board needs to consider if the 80-room hotel under any circumstances or of design or concessions is appropriate for the Sponge Docks District. If not, then the agreement to negotiate should not be approved or altered to the appropriate room count and or height. So we're not at that. Um, Mr. Fritch, as much as I thank you for coming here, and I appreciate you wanting to build something here, which I would like, um, I, I can't go forward on 80 rooms, and I can't even dis discuss to start at 65 rooms. Um, but my question that I would ask you is, when we discussed this last time, 
your comment to the board was you couldn't make money on 99 rooms or even 108 rooms. You couldn't reduce it down. So how are you able to make money on 80 rooms um, now? Did you I, get, well, we we gonna remove the balconies. Balconies, balconies is a substantial cost to build a hotel, right? The hotel will be smaller, right? We're changing some operations, right? So we looked at it. We talked to uh, Choice Hotel, right? Choice said we will do it with you at 80 and not less. Um, I'm willing to say tonight we are not. We we not we we said in the letter or in the application that it would be 80 plus. Uh, my wife and me are willing to say 80 no more, but it doesn't work. Again, <laughs> when you build a business, when you build a hotel, right, there's certain factors which come in, right? For example, the land cost, right? If I go to Clearwater Beach, if I look at an acre of land, I'm looking at $8 million, right? So now I have to charge eight $900 a night, right? For example, I own a Hampton in Dunedin, right? I always look at the Hampton on Clearwater Beach. It has a six-story garage. It's built on a small, small parcel, right? But their, their asking price per night, right, is much higher than mine. But it also their cost to build the whole thing was way more, right? So there's a trade-off, right? I, I told you before that the land is not cheap, right? And it's a good thing. Tarpon is growing, you know. But we looked at this, everything. We said we believe in Tarpon. We talked to Choice, who we want to do it with. Um, we, we live in between Dunedin and Tarpon. I think it's a great location for me and my family. We've been here for 10 years. We come a lot to Tarpon to the sponge dogs, eat there, come there with family when we have it here. Um, not only I told you that a hotel would be a great thing for Tarpon and the sponge dogs, mm -hmm. Choice Hotel Group, a $9 billion, group, $9 billion evaluated group, mm -hmm. tells you that there is a need for a hotel just by knowing how many tourists are there and there's no accommodation. Richie, may I interrupt? Yeah. I, I think the question was concerning about, I, and you answered the question about oh, making stop. money, um, 99 rooms, I think you said, versus 80 rooms. So if we could just move on with a meeting. Ah, okay. Okay, thank, thank you very much. You. you may be asked another question. Yes. So, um, so Mike, my, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, See, I, I hear what you're saying um, about the land value and you know how much you have to pay, but understand something, that is part of making a hotel, part of making a deal. I understand that. Yeah. I, no, no. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, Mr. Mayor. But uh, again, you, it seems like your biggest concern is the size of the building, right? And the difference between 60 and 80 rooms, because if, if this, the size is not so dramatic, right? And I, I, I have my architect here tonight, right? Mm. It's, he doesn't come for free, but I thought it was a good thing for him to talk to you to understand that the difference in size 60 to 80 is not so dramatic than you might think. Well, let me give you my, in, my take of what I think is dramatic. When you were proposing 100 rooms, give or take, 99 to 108, your, the traffic study came back with uh, over 800 cars per day. Um, and we have, in that area, as been said before, it floods constantly. Actually, where you'll be building or would be building, um, that is underwater. Um, so I don't know if you realize that or not. Um, so it, it's just not an opportune place to put such a large structure of the amount of traffic that 80, 80 rooms would uh, constitute. That's what, I, what the big issue is. It, you know, again, you could turn in, in another couple of weeks and come back and say, if I build smaller, I could make it 60 rooms. And that's what I'm hoping for. But, you know, to put 80 rooms in there in that corner of where there's there's just nowhere for us to to grow the roads short of knocking people's homes down 
there's, there's no way in and out of that area. I'm not sure, as other people have said, have you gone through there on high tides and the salt water is just completely covering the streets. You can't go through there. So that is just not a great place to put this. You'd have to pick and choose when your uh, people would be able to come into your hotel. No, Mr. Fritchie, you really need to finish the meeting tonight. I understand. Let's just get, let the commission have their say, and then if there's anything else, um, we'll come back. But as of right now, we I, I think we're also, the commission is straying off a little bit as far as what the objective is for this evening tonight. We're not going to approve anything. Um, it's not an issue of whether a hotel is right or not. We just need to understand, um, you know, whether we're going to approve a uh, moving ahead with the development agreement. All these other things can be answered if it's approved. You come back and then you make your arguments. Commissioner, I further questions. Okay, Commissioner Cuyas. Uh, Mr. Fritz, I don't want to waste your time, and I don't want to waste you using your resources or, or money moving forward at this point. I mean, this city has some serious issues that need to be addressed. Serious land use codes from 2019. Uh, they don't benefit the residents. And they were actually helped constructed by uh, your attorney's uh, colleague. So uh, this stuff is all going to get addressed soon. It, uh, we can't come to an agreement to waste your time to agree on a conditional use that's gonna hold up the city for 10 years. It, it's so, um, and as for balconies, I believe balconies bring quality to a building, so I would like to see balconies on all side, all sides. I'm just throwing that out there, and um, I can't put pressure. I can't put pressure on future boards until we get these ordinances changed, these land use codes that we don't even know how they came about. So uh, I asked. We're about a year out from looking at hotels and certain properties, and we're three months from that last application, in which you had a great application. So if you like Tarpon Springs that much, which I'm sure you do, we're untapped. Another nine months, a little bit further out is not gonna hurt. We got some, a lot of potential. We got more potential than any of these northern cities in Pinellas County. We all know that. So please give us time. Let us clean up some things. And um, we're gonna have a clear understanding. So thank you. Okay. Um, all right, there's some things I'm gonna, that I can say, I don't need to say it because they're not really germane for where we are right now. How I'd like to do is proceed. We've got a question in front of us, an application. I'd like to get that resolved tonight. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, we've gone through public comments, we've heard the commission, what I would like to do is just follow me a bit. Um, the application is for 80, no less than 80 rooms, 80 rooms or greater. So um, I know this commission has talked about um, 50 to 60 rooms um, in the past. I know this is what Mr. LaCourse has been sharing with the applicant um, all along. I also know that Mr. Um, the course has got tremendous flexibility in offering other things that could happen in the future as far as adding additional buildings and that sort of thing. So what I'd like to do is proceed with um, a motion for um, no less than 80 rooms. And um, if I don't get a motion, it dies. If we have a motion and there's no second, it dies. And then I would like to, if a commissioner would like to proceed with uh, a motion of 50 room or no greater than 50 rooms or no greater than 60 rooms. I'd like to hear that. And that will actually provide the answer that Mr. Frischi is looking for. It may not be the one he wants, but it's gonna uh, give him the answer that he's, um, that he's um, looking for as far as what he would work with. There are things that we've already done with the number of the, the uh, the story height which prohibits the four to five stories that was um, discussed before. So that's already in the works. So let's proceed with that. Do I have a motion for uh, no less than 80 rooms? 
I'll make a motion, Mayor, to um, approve the request to negotiate development agreement uh, for no more than 80 rooms. Okay. Is there a second? Okay, I don't hear a second. The motion dies for lack of a second. Is there a commissioner that would like to make an alternative recommendation or an alternative motion? Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve request to negotiate development agreement with no more than 60 rooms. Okay, thank you. Is there a second to that? Okay. There's no second to that. Um, is there any other motion? That, those were the only two I was looking for. Is there any other motion? Mr. Moore, we have I need your help. Uh, not necessarily. The question is, do you have to vote? Uh, you've, 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 you can move in the affirmative and, and have a motion and a second, and that doesn't bind you to the vote itself by moving or seconding you're not bound to approve it you're putting it on the table for the body to vote this body's um if this body is is by its inaction expressing um no desire to to move i it, it's sort of a six one way half a dozen the other result you can have your record vote and get there or you can get there by saying the body was unwilling to entertain a motion and it dies for lack of motion the matter never ends on the table um, that's not without precedent in parliamentary procedure. Uh, I've, I've seen that very recently in another community where, a motion, where an, emo, uh, an ordinance failed for lack of a motion. Um, and so ultimately, it's this body's will how it proceeds. Uh, but at this point, I think you've at least very much made it clear to the, the, that the specific relief requested is not going to be granted if you wish to as a body, um, and that's your discretion procedurally, to have a recorded vote on that, a motion needs to be made, it needs to be seconded, and a vote takes place. If you're comfortable with the message that's been sent, then you can proceed on to the next item on your agenda, Mayor. Okay. Um, Mr. Moore, if there is no motion, and, um, and there, for example, um, does that uh, imply a denial of the application? Yes, that's, that's okay. precisely the point I'm making. I mean, yes, I want to make sure that you know, there's an application, we're required to act on an application within a certain time frame. The, the application, as I understand it, the application on the floor is an application requesting uh, that the city engage in a development agreement for a development of no less than 80 rooms. This bod, the, the deliberative body who considers that took a motion, it, locked, it did not get a second. To the extent the application is specifically uh, for that, that can be considered denied. I would defer to staff if there's some other procedural element of the uh, development agreement process that I'm not as sensitized to, uh, but procedurally, from a parliamentary procedure standpoint, I'm comfortable with where you stand, but staff being more intimately familiar with your process, I've, I just want to make sure that I'm not failing to appreciate something in their, in their dots, eyes they need to dot. I, I don't believe so. I, it, it just says if the board approves it, then they move to the next step. And so, I mean, by not taking any action, you've discussed it publicly. I'll defer to the city attorney, but I think it's done. So let me just thank you, Ms. Vincent. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, one last question. Is there any motion in terms of a motel that you would, Commissioner Eisner? I have to go along with what uh, Commissioner Cooley has said, and uh, I believe also Vice Mayor. We have issues in our land development code that are outside something we didn't create, but we're stuck with, and until we clear that up, I personally wouldn't feel comfortable going ahead with any development, not just this one. Okay. Thank you. That's fair. That's three of you are saying the same thing, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> what the motion is it's not going to pass so i understand all right um mr Fritchie, i'm sorry you didn't get the answer that you wanted this evening but at least you have an answer um i uh, i'm not sure where you go from here or where we go i know we've got some things as the commissioner said that we need to fix so all right all right thank you very much and and you've been a gentleman throughout this and thank you ms cole all right, the last item. Discussion, direction of future 
um, charter um, amendments. Let me uh, get to that. That's something I put on the table. It's the last item, and we're 10 minutes into that. Um, if we have to in five minutes, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, extend the meeting. Um, basically, um, it, the memorandum speaks for itself. The uh, couple of items that we talked about as far as uh, at least I spoke of, and, and I know that some of the commissioners were present um, during the campaign and after we became um, sworn in for the current board, was um, um, one was a um, um, subsection G of the charter uh, for updating the comprehensive plan. Um, now that we're going to have a strategic plan, we would take the same approach of, um, of memorializing the strategic plan in the charter and requiring its update, let's say, every, um, every three years. So that's the one item that would be um, uh, proposed to the residents uh, in the March 2023 election. The, um, the other item in that same section would be budget priorities. I know that budget priorities at least have been discussed several times and they haven't come forward. <coughs> this time we've talked about budget priorities. I think that needs to be memorialized um, in the uh, responsibilities and duty sections of the commission to uh, prior to the budget process or at the beginning of the budget process that the commission meet to establish what the budget priorities are as a, at a public meeting and allow residents to, uh, uh, to participate in that through the normal process we have with comments giving each resident four, sec four minutes each. Um, section 12 is another, uh, the zoning powers. There was a lot of discussion of giving the uh, PNZ board some autonomy for certain um, land use actions and um, they've gone through a workshop and, and um, have come up with some ideas on that. So that would be something that, uh, another one. And then, of course, there's one that is a um, kind of a, a oh, kind of clean, cleaning up the language a little bit concerning the titles on department heads and uh, re their residency requirement. Of course, I said that one can wait um, for a full charter uh, commission at, at some point in time in the future. But these others, I think, are important, especially when it comes to the, uh, um, uh, the strategic plan memorializing that and also uh, the uh, providing the PNC board some autonomy. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. The, there's other information in the, in the uh, memorandum, but I wanted to get that out uh, and done this evening. Um, let me uh, go to any, any comments in the public. Anita Frodus, 901 Bayshore Drive. Just remember, these boards are people who volunteer to be on these boards. Uh, planning and Zoning, the Historic Preservation Board, all of these boards, do they have a background to serve on these boards? We've already had one person come up here who's thinking about running, telling you, Mayor, we're here to support you, which we all are. Whatever you want from planning and zoning, we'll make sure you tell us. That's a violation. That should not be. That means a regular uh, resident in here may not have a fair chance. People on these boards that don't understand the background, but they want to be on that board. Are you going to have classes to educate them? What the board is about? What they're responsible for? So before we give autonomy to a lot of these boards, you need to set rules to make sure they know what they're doing on those boards. Think about it. Thank you. Um, let me go to the commission comments. Um, Vice Mayor Lund. I'm sorry. Oh, the time. Do you have anybody oh, on the phone? Time in the oh, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> IT, do we have any comments? If anyone is online who'd like to speak on the side, please raise your hand. You'll be allowed in to talk. And we do have a raised hand, so I'll allow the first person in. But, um, Mr. Jump, let's hold on one second and extend the meeting time. Um,
commission, I'd like to have a motion to extend the meeting time for whatever you're comfortable with. Motion to extend the meeting to 1120. Second. 1120. Second. Is there a second? Roll call, please. Commissioner Diaz? <coughs> yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? No. Vice Mayor Lund? Yes. Mayor Van Giotis? Yes. Um, IT, proceed, please. Okay, if you can please state your name and address for the record. Surely. Peter Delacus, 504 Ashland Avenue. Uh, I have to follow up with uh, Mrs. Protus's comments. As much as I appreciate the efforts the Planning and Zoning Board does, it is just an advisory group. It does allow residents an option to hear some of the facts and, and share some information, but ultimately any kind of zoning decision should be within the control and power of the Board of Commissioners. So unless there was strict rules and guidelines, and as Ms. Protus mentioned, some kind of an educational program uh, to educate people because there's a complex, I've been on the Planning and Zoning Board and there's a lot of complex issues that a lot of people who don't have familiarity with uh, that they have to be judging on. So at this point, I would say I would leave that part alone. I do agree with the subsections about adding the strategic plan and also the budget advisor, uh, budget priorities being included with that. But at this time, uh, I would not recommend going forward on giving autonomy uh, to the Planning and Zoning Board. Uh, they do serve their purpose in giving you advice it's up to you all to listen to their advice and see if it's appropriate. If not, then you can determine uh, if a project or a particular uh, item that they're presenting should go forward. But the ultimate decision should be within the Board of Commissioners. Thank you, and I won't keep you any longer. Y'all have a good evening. God bless. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just say that the um, there's only certain things that the PNZ Board can do. They can't uh, they're not autonomous in legislative matters. Um, that's the purview of the commission. So there are very specific things that they've had a couple of workshops uh, to draw that what those things are. And quite frankly, in my opinion, all of our boards need training. That's <laughs> that's nothing new. Whether you're a volunteer and you don't have any authority at all, they all need training. Um, secondly, we also have a board of adjustment and appeals that's not advisory. And uh, the only reason I'm bringing this up with regard to the PNZ board is that they are identified in the charter as an advisory board. And if um, they are able to um, uh, act on anything, um, that has to change. And whether it's just one item out of, the, let's say, the 10 things that they do. But every th the comments that were made tonight are appropriate, they're valid, and I don't think there's any disagreement with any of them. Um, so anyway, let me go to back to Vice Mayor Lund. All right. So hmm. on the uh, well, let me let me just say one last clarification. We're not approving any charter amendments. This is, this is just to direct the discuss. attorney to come back with some questions that you can look at and then make a determination of whether you want to put them forward to the residents or not. I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Lund. Yeah, how long did it take us to do this strategic plan? 18 months? Or so? The strategic plan? Yeah, to get to this point with the strategic plan, it's been about 18 months? Yes. Okay, so 18 months, how often would we want to review it? Every three years to Every three synchronize years, so it. So we with want to spend half of, our, no. half of our life reviewing the strategic plan. Well, the I, comp I don't think so. The comp plan is already in for three years. The comp plan is already in the yeah, charter. Yeah, I know. And then we want the strategic plan every three years, so we're going to be viewing it, plans more than anything else. They're, they're updates. They're not For major rewrites. overhauls. Yeah, I mean, it, I understand, but okay. I'm just just throwing it out there. I didn't no, say no, I, I was for it or against it. I'm just, I'm just trying to get, get used to the ramifications. I mean, I'm only here for one you know six four months but let's not get reelected so well maybe not but let's let's <laughs> yeah. let's let's be positive yeah, so um having said that 
I'm probably leaning towards memorializing it and getting it to, to something that we need because I think a strategic plan is something we need to go forward. I might almost want to see it amended every year. But, well, I, I mean, mean, it's strategic it, in nature, it's not long term, right? No, no, and, and I mean, I understand what you're saying. I, mean, I just want to go through the, I don't want to go through the whole process that we okay. did with this one. All right. Um, at least not that frequently. Um, on the subject of uh, budget priorities, um, I thought that's what the strategic plan sort of mapped out with the priorities, and then we need to budget to those priorities. I, I, we, I'm having a difficulty mentally breaking the two apart. This is not charge. Since this is my item, let me let me answer that. Um, basically, um, you've got the strategic plan that that outlines what the priorities are. Um, the city manager, you know, what we do is basically within now what those are basically um, generalized items that are in there. And so we, there's gonna be some things that the city manager's gonna bring forward as far as, let's, most of it's gonna be capital improvements. And so um, that's where the commission says, well, these are where our priorities are, roads, water, that sort of thing, based on what we're saying. So it's, it's actually putting something that is um, more material to something that's idealistic, I guess, if you will, that's all. All right. Um, we're talking about a capital improvement we need, plan. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. It, it right now is probably not the best time to talk about it. But in order to get these, um, well, late in the year, I think it's a work section. There's a time, time yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, I, I kind of you know establishing priorities for me. If there's priorities and goals and ways, that's that's perfect. That's what, what the most important part of this is that we have workshops. We don't have public meetings for the budget until the very end. Yeah, I know we have them in the front. We don't, I, have, we don't have public meetings for the, at the front. Is, I, excuse me, if, if we have them in the front. Yeah. It yeah. would give the residents. I've always thought that saying, here, here's your budget, you know, just back, kind of backwards. Personally. So this would actually kind of. Yes, it would get the public involved at an earlier state. Yeah. And if that's the whole intent, I'm for it 150%. Uh, I'd be mighty, mighty cautious about giving the planning and zoning uh, board any sort of autonomy at all. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but have you seen their meetings? Sometimes they don't even know how to have a meeting. It's, it's, they're not ready for prime time. <laughs> I'm saying, and I mean, unless there was like a, you know, two month university course, or maybe we could set one up at St. Pete JC, or St. Pete, <laughs> you know, a two month course on how to be an effective board member, then that would probably do it for me. But otherwise than that, I don't think so. Not from what I've seen. I mean, I know, Last year was a big thing. Oh, we never really want to override the PNZ board. And then what is the first thing we did? We overrode the PNZ board because they made a stupid decision. So I, I don't think so at this time. I'm not for it. That's, that's about all I have to comment on in this. So. Okay. Commissioner Carr. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I, I'll just touch based on the PNZ board. I've sat on that board for many years. Um, I don't think it's a good idea to give them any autonomy. I think it's an advisory board. Uh, that's the way they're appointed to the board. Um, yeah, would you want more power and more authority? Of course, if you're on that board, but at the end of the day, they're not there to make the final decisions. Uh, again, it w the backup doesn't show or doesn't say what that autonomy is or what that would actually entail. So I can't really go off of anything, but I don't. I would throw a ton of caution at that. Um, and I think it's best for the commission to be the ones to make those decisions in that case. Um, if we're looking at the charter, I think there's a couple other things that we need to look at. There's a sidewalk fund, 
there's a current cap of a hundred thousand dollars it's going to take 22 plus years to use that money i think that needs to be increased and if the city's looking or if the commission as a board is looking to go back and ask the residents to vote on anything i think that's an area that we need to lift um, that dollar amount further so it could be up to two hundred thousand dollars a year or something along those lines with at least x amount of dollars coming from other funds for matching uh, and then the civil service board which is section 19 i think it was discussed during the last charter i still don't know the need for this it, i think it's sat dormant for many many years um, unless it's gonna be reactivated i don't really see why the the city needs to have that in the charter form um, it can be formed in a resolution if, if needed um, but the fact that it's in the charter and it's not being used, I think, needs to be removed. Um, and then Section 20, I, I mean, if we want to add it, add it. There's no need to wait. Um, but in my regard, I have no issues with people living outside the city. For those, two, for those two positions, I think the rest of it's called out pretty well currently, the way it sits. So just to recap, um, I think the sidewalk fund should be increased to be able to pull more, pull more money out of it. Planning and zoning, no autonomy. Um, and the civil service board language should be removed if we're not going to use it. Thanks. Okay. Um, Commissioner Eisner. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. So on the um, strategic plan, I think we can just slightly modify it. I don't want to go through a full-blown what we did. Um, I think it could just be modified as we go where we see um, errors or things that are hiccups for, for what you want to call it. Um, so that's the way I would go with that. <clears throat> the budget, I would definitely want to have transparency and have the public to um, have input, have their ideas. We're supposed to be representing and you know the residents in the first place and yet we're not actually giving them any option unless they get to speak to us with a phone call, an email, or some way, and it's it's that's it's just not fair. So um, that's where I stand with that. Um, as far as the planning and zoning, um, I also sat for seven years on a autonomous board. We made our final decision, and there were times that that board made decisions that made my what's left of my hair stand up and the rest of it, I, I just would sit there. So, you know, you can't, I don't know if you can have some of the boards, volunteer boards, um, be autonomous and some not. You know, what, what makes that person? I mean, people fill out these applications. They say, uh, my first choice is to be on the planning and zoning. My second choice is to be in the music department. I mean, you know, it's like they, they don't, they just put things down. So. Uh, there's no testing to say you qualify to do this, that, or the other. Um, if I go back into the Planning and Zoning Board back in 2019, I agree with Vice Mayor that it looked, it looked horrific. Yet, if you look at the current Planning and Zoning Board, um, th they were pretty proficient, but it depends. Then you have a, a decision that if, if people are out and you have alternates coming in, or do they know anything about it? You know, I've watched alternates on my own board sit there and they look like a deer in headlights. You know, it's like, what, I gotta vote? I mean, nobody told me that I have to even vote. So it was like, it, it's, we do need training on all of them. Um, I think if we do allow some autonomous voting on the planning and zoning, it's gotta be very, very specific. Um, I don't know whether it's to be on a dollar amount or a size of a project. Um, I don't know, we could put all sorts of stipulations in. I think they could use some power, um, but I just wouldn't give full reign, no, because they could be there one week and not the next. You know, anyone could resign. I, I believe that when you become a commissioner, you're, you're in it for your term, unless something really happens to you. So that, that's my take on it. As far as the residency, I again, in these day and age, it's so hard to get um, qualified people if we put more restrictions on for where they live. 
you know, is a person that's living in holiday, not going to take care of our town. They're there to, you know, we, we could remove anybody or either they're going to do the good the job well or not. So I don't really see that. Th that was done years ago, you know. Yeah. So that's my take on the thing, but I'd like to have a workshop on this as well right. so that we could discuss yeah. it. Commissioner Kouyas. Thank you, Mayor. I, I'm for the three every three years for updating the comprehensive plan and, and looking for it. Um, as far as updating the strategic plan, I would recommend at least every two years. So uh, a commissioner has the opportunity to do it once, at least twice, depending on how it cycles out. Um, the budget prior, prioritizing, I have no problem with that. Um, I am concerned about the autonomy of the planning and zoning board. Uh, you know, the, the last year or so hasn't been so great with communication and going back and forth with stuff. Uh, right, we have a good board now, but who knows if we'll have a good board in the future? And, you know, who knows if they're willing to implement the will of the residents as well. So I am okay. concerned about that. There, there could be pressure on them. And, um, uh, residency, I, I I think our building director and our public works directors, you know, just f I think they need to be able to l live in town. They're, they're pretty much directors. I, I think with the current unique situations we have right now with some of those positions, I wouldn't mind uh, getting this passed, but having them grandfathered in until a new hire and giving that new hire uh, ample time to be able to move into the city. but. I have the feeling of if you live in the city, you care about it a lot more as opposed to living outside of it. That's just how I feel about it. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, back to the planning and zoning board. Uh, 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 we don't want to give too much power in case that we don't know who gets in there and what intentions are. So okay. thank you. Right. Um, what we could do is, is have a, a uh, let's say, a motion on, on uh, the things that we had a, at least most of us are okay with, which would be the comp plan, I'm sorry, strategic plan and the budget priorities, or we could defer this item. And, and I mean, for me, it's obvious that I'm not being very fair to you because there's a lot of um, information that's not here with, with um, the budget. I'm sorry, the, the workshops that the PNZ board went through and um, some of these other things with regard to the residency, which to me is not really important. I mean, it is extremely important. The residents have made it very, very clear they want depart some department heads, critical ones, living in the city limits. And that's been that way since I was city manager. And, um, and it was just as a result of the way the, the referendum question was asked in 2020, that created this anomaly that we've got with a name. So it was really just correcting the titles. One title, though. Right. It's just, just because a, that title right, doesn't Right. It's just the titles, not changing the residency, but as of, uh, uh, the city manager would be able to shed some additional lights, he would prefer until the next charter revision, which would be, what, about three years or so, two or three <laughs> years from now. Uh, but but some of these other things, as far as the, the, uh, the, the comprehensive plan, and also, I'm sorry, the strategic plan and also the, the budget priorities, I think would th those two mesh together, they would be good to come along. Um, but I also think that there is some, um, uh, a, a great deal more of information concerning the PNZ board, and it would be a very limited uh, role. And, and you can't do anything right now because of the, the way the, uh, uh, the language of the charter is written. So, um, so we don't, at least lose anything tonight or you know, there's a waste of time why don't we just uh could could we get a motion would everybody agree to a motion on the uh strategic plan and then the budget priorities and then anything else we could bring that back if we want to when um when we bring the land purchases back which are also going to be referendum questions at some point in the future does that sound okay to you yes okay to the body, my advice would be if you're going to, since there are multiple items being considered, that it would be best to take them one at a time to the Take them one at a time? That okay. way it's a clear, All right. no, no, it's clear good. record. Yeah, let me uh, let me go ahead and do that. Mayor, what about the additional items I brought up? Pardon me? What about the additional items I brought up? 
the time? No. The sidewalk fund, civil service oh, board, and things along those lines. Um, I mean, there's other things in the, the charter. The only, the, the only, my, I mean, that's something that we can talk about. The only reluctance I have is that um, in dealing with that matter is I was on the Charter Revision Commission, the last one, and that was an item that was discussed in ad infinitum. And uh, what I've asked for are basically new things. What you're asking for is basically change something that the Charter Revision Commission spent an awful lot of time to uh, change from what it was before uh, to what it is right now, and the, and the residents voted on it. Um, if we could, we could add that as an as another item, um, or we could. It's getting to the point where we may just want to defer the whole thing for tonight and meet, do it again at some I, future. I mean, I, I think a true workshop is going to serve the board well in all of this to really understand the charter, to, to go through I the believe details. Because so I, I agree with Jacob about the sidewalk stuff. That $100,000 a year is, is no longer feasible. Okay. I mean, and there's other things changes of names and maybe some other minor things. That well, before before this changed to $100,000 a year, the only thing that you could actually spend was the interest. I off understand that. that. I, yeah. I know and what so the difference it was, was. It was really... But uh, I, mean, there's, there's, I mean, it's perfectly within our board's purview. purvey to recommend charter stuff. We don't have to wait for the Charter Review Commission. Right. If we see stuff, I don't want to wait another three years to fix it. Okay, because ultimately it's up to the residents to approve it anyway. Well, yeah, I know. They have to approve it. It's, it's an election coming up. But I don't want to wait another three years to fix stuff that might be so obviously broken. Okay. But I think we need a workshop to go through this charter and, and to vet that out rather than piecemeal it in 10 minutes at 11 o'clock. Let, let me ask the city manager. Do you think we're going to have an opportunity for that? I can try to find a date for you. But, but again, well, we're running on time and we're running about. But well, we've got to deal with the property purchases anyway, yes, right? and we're so hopefully any day going to get those. Why don't, why don't we go ahead for the sake of time tonight, go ahead and defer this we'll item until the workshop, and then we'll uh, pick it up at that time and address some of the things that uh, Commissioner Carr brought up as well. And and uh, we'll go because there is a whole lot of information. Maybe a, a presentation by Ms. Vincent as well would be helpful. And it might be good for you to submit any of those other charter things to me, like like you had submitted. Um, submit if you see other items in the oh, charter. Yeah, so to we can draw up a list. So I can have a list to set up and that's stuff. Absolutely right. Okay. All right. Um, motion. May to I have defer. a motion to defer this item? Motion to, to defer to a date uh, to be determined. Is that is that acceptable? For purposes of an item where you're deferring it somewhat indefinitely to a future workshop, that's okay. appropriate. There's there's no right. land use right or any issue. That's what I'm, my motion All right. is. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kuyas? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Commissioner Carr? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. All right. It's 11-18. Um, let's quickly go through uh, comments. Uh, Chief Young? No comments. Uh, Mr. Moore. No comment. It's late. No Let's city see. manager. Ms. No Jacobs. Comment. No comment. Vice Mayor <laughs> Commissioner Carr. No comments. Commissioner Eisner. All right. Commissioner Kulias. <laughs> no comments. Do I have a comment? No, we'll call it a night. Actually, I have it, a comment. I, I, I didn't mean to deprecate the PNC board, but I've seen some pretty crazy meetings there. <laughs> so uh, well, my apologies. Let me just say something. It's a full moon. All right. City manager knows what I'm talking about. So actually this meeting went okay tonight, given that it was a full moon. Absolutely. But there was some zany activity during it. So, and a few comments and a little brain freeze on my part. So I think everybody did good. We're adjourned at 1119. Randy, thank you. Oh, you, you were looking at was the old plan.